everyone, welcome back. It's the first stream of 2020. Um, and this is going to be probably the last stream on porting the concurrent hash map from Java to Rust. Um, this will be part three, I think. Um, and we did part two about a month ago. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time like walking through where we left off last time so that we're all on board and with what we're going to do this stream. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, if so, it's a little weird that you're in part three. You should probably start at part one. Um, I am John. I, um, I'm a PhD student at MIT, and I do a bunch of these live streams where we try to build, like, write real Rust code that does interesting stuff and really get into weeds and program something complicated. Um, if you want to support me, I have a, an Amazon wish list where you can get me stuff that I need in my life or want in my life, I guess. Um, the code for uh, part one and part two is already up on GitHub, um, and I'll push the changes that we make um, today as well to here afterwards. Hopefully, by the time we finish today, this page will be a lot more helpful. Like My guess is in addition to doing things like writing tests, we're also going to expand upon the readme, um, write some decent documentation, maybe set up CI, a bit of the sort of more meta stuff for projects. Um, the Java code, I think I've linked to in, uh, in past streams, uh, but the Java code reporting is available online on a, under a sort of weird license, uh, but one that allows us to publish a port with the same license, at least as far as I'm aware. If you know otherwise, please tell me. Um, uh, and the Java test suite is also online. Um, and so all these files I've linked from the repository. So if you look down here, uh, the source file is linked here from the GitHub repository. Um, and also the tests are linked right here. Um, before we uh, before we dive in, um, one thing you should know is also that this will probably be the last stream for a little while. Um, I am my my plan is to graduate sometime the end of this year, um, as in like somewhere in the September to December range. Um, and so I need to like actually sit down and do that. Um, so I don't know how much time I'll have to do streams in like the coming months. Um, I'll try to get in like maybe a few more in 2020, but I don't know when they'll be just so you're prepared for that. Uh, I am not planning to stop though. Like, I think this is really fun. I think it's interesting to build stuff in this way. Uh, and so even though there might be a, a bit of a hiatus, um, the plan is to keep going. All right. So let's dig into the code. Um, uh, I think that should be large enough for everyone to see. Uh, so the code we had last time, um, where we, let's make that a little bit smaller and fit some more on screen. That's probably good. Um, it's a pretty straightforward port of the Java code. The trickiest parts you'll remember from part two is dealing with all the safety guarantees and dealing with garbage collection. Um, we, while we did the implementation, um, we left a couple of to-dos for ourselves that we might deal with in this stream. Um, things that I marked as to-do here are things that aren't necessary in order to have a working implementation, but they're things that we will want to fix before like n not just a 1.0 release, but before like a public release, the, like either because um, there are safety guarantees that we need to really write down the explanation for, or there are API changes that um, we really want to get to. So for example, the get method for this hash map currently returns you this, um, this shared type that you might remember from Crossbeam. And um, it's a little awkward for this to be exposed in the public interface. It also means that if we say um, upgrade the version of Crossbeam to a Semver incompatible version, then that will also require us to update the, the major version of this library because we directly expose one of their types. Um, and so that's a little awkward and we probably want to mask this at the very least behind a new type, um, but maybe something more than that. Um, so one way to do that, for example, would be to stick um, if you recall with these shared, you need this notion of a guard. Uh, and that is that is why this currently takes a guard in. One option here is for get to construct the guard itself um, and then for us to wrap that in some, some kind of returned guard type. Um, this is something we can think about a little bit later. Um, let's look at what other to-dos we have. 
Um, yes, yeah, so we did not implement the Java version has this notion of upgrading. Um, if you have a, uh, if you have a bucket that gets very long, right? For us, the buckets are linked lists. Um, then if the bucket gets very long, it gets converted into a tree. Um, and that's an optimization that we have not implemented, um, but it's something that you'd probably want to add. Um, but, but it's something that is entirely behind the scenes. And so it's not something that end users will notice except, except in terms of performance. Um, Let's see, what else do we have that's a to-do? Um, this ordering can maybe be relaxed. Okay, that's somewhere we're gonna leave for later. Um, Treeify, that's uh, if you notice that you wanna turn something into a tree, we can ignore that for later. Um, ah, so add count, this is used for uh, whenever you add or remove items from the map then add count is used both to, both to keep track of the number of elements in the table, um, but also in order to figure out uh, whether we need to do resizes of the table, right, to, to grow it in particular. I don't think there's a shrink that's supported. Um, and the Java version um, does not just use like an atomic integer for this, it uses this notion of a counter cell, which as far as I could understand it, uh, we'll have to go back and look at earlier streams, um, counter cell is essentially like a sharded counter. Um, and the reason you want to do this is if you have just one integer that, uh, like one memory location that holds a number that all the writer threads are going to be adding to, then you create a lot of contention on that one number. Um, and it's, it's not really, um, it, it, it might turn into a scalability bottleneck, right? Because if every write has to go through that one number, then barring some kind of like concurrent optimizations made by the CPU because it notices that they're all ads or something, um, it, it could become a point of contention and something that reduces the performance in highly concurrent scenarios. Um, and so if you have a sharded counter instead, you might have, for example, one counter per core, then, um, when you increment it, there's no cost. It's only when you have to read the value of all of them that um, you have to pay that cost. And the, the, the original Java code has a bunch of code for dealing with that situation. And here we've simplified it into um, just having a single integer counter because it was just easier. Uh, and the, this in some sense comes back to the old adage of like, you don't want to do premature optimization, right? The counter cell business is an optimization. And I don't think it's premature into the Java code. I think it wouldn't have been added unless they found that it was useful in, in real world scenarios. But for us, when we first port this, we should start with the simpler version and then we can add the optimizations later. Like this might make for good PRs uh, down the line. Given that this code is a little different from the Java code, um, this is one place I suspect there might be bugs, right? Because much of the other code is almost like a direct transcription of the Java code into Rust, uh, whereas this code is not, right? This code is different. Um, all right, what other to-dos do we have? Um, yeah, so this... Um, you'll remember in the, in the concurrent hash map, if there's a resize, then the way the Java version does this, and this is pretty cool, is if a thread tries to do an insert and it notices that the table is being resized, it joins in the resize effort, right? It joins the, the thread that is currently doing the resize in helping it with resize. And the, the reason this can work is um, when you allocate a new table that's sort of twice as large and it's twice as, twice as many buckets, you need to move all the elements from the old table to the new table. And um, each bin can basically be moved independently. And so you can have multiple threads that are assisting with the resize. And there's this uh, size CTL, so size control field, um, that's atomically updated and managed in order to keep track of like um, how many threads are doing what work. Um, and this is one clause where f for some reason it, um, it it like adds two and I don't know why this is. So this is something that I think we'll want to, um, we'll want to look at why this code does what it is, like figure out why this is an RS plus two 
Um, and I think we spent a little bit of time thinking about this last time, uh, but it's something where once we figure it out, we should probably add a comment. This is one thing where the Java code, let me pull that up here. Um, actually, how about we do, yeah. Um, this is one place where the Java code is not great at comments. So the Java code has a lot of top level comments for how the thing works. Um, but it doesn't really dive into, uh, let's see if I can find this here. Talks a lot about the representation, but it doesn't necessarily talk about all of the different fields. Like for example, when we get down to, um, size CTL. So it talks a little bit about this, but uh, in the place where it does like RS uh, plus two, this place, there aren't any comments that explain this code, right? Even though there's an explanation for what SciCTL is, um, this code is not very well explained. And so I think once we figure that out, it would be good to update the documentation here. And we've tried to do that as we've been doing the port. You'll notice as I scroll through here as well, a bunch of the safety um, arguments that we made last time, right? We looked for all the blocks where we needed to write unsafe um, and we documented why we believe that they're safe. And this is also something that the Java code does not have in part because there's no notion of unsafe in Java, even though they do, they sort of assume that certain pointers are valid. And here in Rust, of course, we have to, um, we have to use unsafe to, to basically tell the compiler, we promise that this is safe. And alongside any such unsafe block, it's sort of good practice to document why do we believe that this is safe. Um, I think even there's a there's a clippy lint I think um, that requires there to be um, a safety explanation above every unsafe, uh, but I haven't used it myself. I just learned about it recently. Um, yeah, so this is. Uh, essentially, if you have many threads helping to do um, a resize, currently we just sort of hard code how many, um, uh, let's say you have four threads, right? They need to know how many uh, bins to skip when they have to pick the next bin that they're going to move. Um, and this is something that really should depend on the number of CPUs. Like there's no reason to have more threads helping with resize than you have CPUs, for example. And here's something where we also just like, don't deal with that currently, but it should be easy to add. Um, okay, I think that's all the to-dos. Um, and then we left one fix me, uh, two fix me's. Oh, I remember this one. Okay, so um, this is a somewhat complicated safety argument. Um, and here there's a particular case where we couldn't quite figure out what the argument was for why it was safe. Um, the Java code assumes that it's safe. And so we, in some sense, we have it on good authority that it is safe. Um, but if, if we want to stick to this notion of giving the safety guarantees explicitly, we should finish this paragraph for why exactly this is safe. Um, and the other fix me, which is where we left off last time, uh, is starting to write tests for this map. Uh, and so that is actually where we're gonna start today is write a test that creates a map and does nothing with it, uh, and write a test that creates a map, inserts into it, and tries to read from it. And these might seem like simple tests, uh, and it might be that they work like the first time we try them. Uh, it seems somewhat unlikely, but we should try it. Um, and we're about to find out. Um, let's look at, did we actually add a test directory? No, we did not. I thought we did. I guess maybe I was wrong. All right. Um, so the first thing we have to choose is whether we're going to write these as unit tests or write them in the same um, directory or same, like basically within the, the crate itself, or whether we're going to have a separate sort of test directory. I like to do the latter. Uh, unit tests are best for testing things that are internal only that you can't access through the normal APIs. So we might end up adding some of these eventually, but I think for the time being, what we want to add are... Um, uh, our integration tests. So I'm going to do uh, make their tests here, and then we're going to say 
tests. Um, let's call it just basic. The, the reason I call it basic here is because we probably want different testing modules for different, different things. So for example, I'm going to assume that we're going to have one test file for all of the Java test cases. In fact, the, I think there are multiple even. Um, uh, if we, this is going to be a little bright for those of you with, who are in dark rooms. Um, yeah, so here the the Java concurrent hash map comes with a bunch of uh, a bunch of tests, and uh, all of these we probably want to port into the Rust version. Um, I wonder if there's a just like a straightforward. What's map check? Uh, Oh, these look like they're. Interesting. New map. Yeah, these look like relatively basic tests, but I want something that, first of all, I, I want to keep all the ported tests in their own files. Um, this will make it easier to, like, if uh, imagine the, the Java authors add more tests to these. It'll be easier to keep the Java ones and the Rust ones uh, up to speed because they'll sort of map one-to-one -one in the files. Um, but also I want some tests that are just like completely dumb and are just like, I'm thinking things like um, uh, new, <laughs> right? I want to see that new doesn't panic. Um, and here, of course, we're going to do use flurry star um, just because it's handy in the test. And let's look at in source lib, what is the name of our type? Flurry hash map. Map is flurry hash map new. Do we even have a new? Do we have a default? OK, so we don't currently have a way of constructing a new flurry hash map. So that sounds like something we need to fix um, maybe first. Um, so let's do pubfn new. That's read on itself. And in fact, this is a good question. We don't even necessarily know um, how you create a new one of these because we didn't implement the new method. And if you look at it, like there are a bunch of fields here that need to have sensible default values. Um, all right, so. Um, let's look at, I wonder if it's called, what's the constructor called in Java? I forget how, constructor. Uh, uh, it's read object. Um, oh, it's just called the name, the same as the, I think it's just called the same as the type. New empty map with default initial table size. All right. So you'll notice they have a bunch of different constructors here. Uh, and they all seem to call to this one. Uh -huh. I see. So there's a, there's sort of a default you have to have with the default initial table size. Okay, how is that initiated? I guess uh, for each field, there's probably a default value then. Um, let's look at a field like uh, size CTL. Uh, Interesting. It doesn't actually say anywhere what the default value. Maybe the default value there is just zero. I forget what the. Um, yeah, maybe these really are just default. Interesting. Because it looks like the default constructor here 
doesn't change any of the fields, which presumably just means that they are their default value. But then where does the 16 come from? Let's look for 16. Default capacity. Okay, so where is default capacity used? Uh huh. Init table. Well, init table seems pretty promising. Okay, where does init table called? Oh, you know what? I think it actually just sets it to null. And then insert is the thing that actually initializes the table. So this is why the um, this is why the constructor is empty, is because it doesn't actually have to do anything because uh, insert will already do the creation of the map for us. All right, so let's look at what new is going to look like. It's going to be sort of self, um, and then we're going to have. I guess table, which then I suppose might just be null. Like maybe the intention here is we set all of these to null. We set count to be atomic u size new. Um, transfer index just defaults to zero, I guess. Uh, so this is going to be zero. Transfer index is going to be zero. Uh, size CTL is going to be zero. Um, ah, and build hasher. Right. So here we actually need to take um, here we need to take out of the book for uh, the Rust hash map. Well, you notice uh, if we do this, new is implemented on. Um, so notice that the, the map itself is generic over KV and S, where S defaults to random state. And you'll notice that new is only implemented for uh, S as random state. Um, and what is S here? Well, uh, remember that we need to have a way, we need to be able to choose how to hash keys into bucket indexes, right? So you need some kind of hashing scheme. Um, and random state, if we look at it over here, um, random state is a thing that constructs a, uh, a hasher um, that has a random initial state. So this means that all any given key is going to initialize is going to hash to the same value. But if you have two different random states and you hash the same value, the, the same key, um, you might get different hashes. But within each one, they'll remain consistent over time. Uh, the reason for this is to provide um, sort of uh, resistance to adversarial choices of keys. Um, there's a lot more you can read about this. For now, just think of this as um, one way to initialize a hasher and a sort of secure secure way to um, initialize a hasher. Uh, no, size CTL has to be I size because it can be negative. Um, but but specifically, you'll notice that hash map new is only implemented when the S is random state. And then you'll see that for um, for the generic S, then it's it's a with hasher method that actually takes the S you want to use. Um, and I believe we also set ours to be S equals random states, where we're in essentially the same uh, position as the standard map, where we want to allow the user to provide uh, their own hasher should they so choose. Um, but for the new method, we actually want to say just the same as for the standard one, where this is going to be random state. And then it's not going to be generic or S. And in that case, um, build hasher is going to be random state new. And in theory, now this should work. Let's just try to compile it and see what happens. 
Um, we get a number of, what is this? Uh, 427. I guess there's some, why do we have this, I wonder? Oh, we don't currently use the resize hint for anything. Um, so here, I guess we'll do use the resize hint. This is something the Java code uses to be smarter about when and how it does resizes. And it's something we didn't implement. Um, and so I just want, I'm just going to silence that warning. Um, and load factor is also a to do actually use the load factor. Actually, let's look at how does the load factor used here? Um, and it's used in read object, write object. And in the default constructor. I wonder why that's even there. Load factor. It's this thing. All right, so what is load factor used for here? It's used to set the number of buckets. Okay, so this is, um, if the user says what capacity they want us to support, right? So hash maps generally have this constructor that's called with capacity. Um, if the user gives that, then um, in order to support that number of elements, our table actually needs to be a little bit larger than that because we want to resize, um, we want to resize once we reach a certain load factor. And the reason for this is at some load factor, you end up with too many keys that hash to the same bucket, uh, even though not every bucket is full. Um, and so that's where this comes in. So it's actually correct that this one is not currently used because it will only be used to compute what the sort of size up we use um, should be. Um, all right. So I guess that means that we'll do here um, just for our own sanity's sake, we'll do a with capacity um, n, right? So this is the same thing that the uh, standard library has. Um, and what does that actually do? Well, it... Right, we're not going to allow concurrency level to be set. So what does the thing that just takes capacity, concurrency level of one. Okay, so we'll just blindly copy what they do, right? Um, and so there's like an assertion here that, uh, uh, that the n is greater than zero, which I guess is really a assert ne. Um, if initial capacity is less than concurrency level, initial capacity here is the number that they pass in. Concurrency level is going to be one because we don't let the user set it for now. Um, and the initial capacity can't be zero, so this condition can never be met. So it's really going to be these. Uh, so really what's going to happen here is we're going to create the map using uh, new. Um, and then we're computing. Uh, we're computing here. 1.0. Plus the initial capacity divided by the load factor, um, where this is really a as f64, and this whole thing as um, i size, probably u size, um, and then the cap is going to be if the size. If the size is greater than the maximum capacity, then we limit it to maximum capacity. Otherwise, we do this table size four. 
And then we say m size CTL is equal to that cap. And then we return m. Uh, what does table size four do? Do we have, already have this table size four? No. Um, <coughs> uh, if the n is equal to zero, should you return error rather than assert? Um, that's a good question. Uh, my thinking here is it's really annoying for with capacity to take a, um, to return a result just for the one case where n is zero. Um, I would probably instead just document that, uh, with capacity, um, uh, with the, the value provided to with capacity must be at least zero or it will panic. It, it it would be totally, it would be a legitimate choice to make the return type of result. In this particular case, I, I think it's probably overkill. Um, okay, so what does table size four do? Uh, returns a power of two table size for the desired, given desired capacity. Oh, uh, really? Is this really just next power of two? Why is it not called that then? Uh, section three. Oh, do you actually have to buy it? I have this book. Actually, I have this book right here. Uh, Hacker's Delight. Hacker's Delight. Let's see. Section three. So Hacker's Delight is a. It's an interesting book. It's um. It's basically got all these neat, weird tricks you can pull. Um, three, two, rounding up or down to the next power of two. Uh, let's see what they say. Uh huh. Uh huh. Minus one left shifted by number of leading zeros of n minus one. Okay, that looks like the next power of two. But it's computing it like with uh Yeah, and then it's capping it at maximum capacity. Okay, so in that case, instead of doing all of that stuff, uh, we are just gonna do size next power of two. Which I believe is in the center library. The smallest power to greater than or equal to self. Yep. Great. Uh, and let's just make a note here. Uh, this is Table size four in Java, just for our own sanity's sake. And now we should no longer have the warning about load factor because we actually use it. All right, let's see what next. Um, unused import build hasher. Okay, so there are a couple of things here. First, uh, this has to be an atomic eye size new. Uh, and I guess it's going to be as I size. Uh, something about this build hasher that's not quite right. 
145. Um, ah, that's not at all what I intended to do. Um, what I intended to do was just to have that impl block be there for the new methods and then this be for any s where s is build hasher let's see how it feels about that um, self dot hash 152 is that didn't we make a function for this hash thing uh, what is our get to wait did I just delete a bunch of code that I did not intend to delete Where's our get function? I definitely deleted a bunch of code I did not intend to delete. Okay, let's uh, undo that terrible change of mind. Let's bring get and friends back. Yeah, I don't know how I ended up deleting those. There we go. That's more like it. Yeah, it's, I somehow just deleted the entire top chunk of this block. That's not what I intended to do. Um, uh, next power of two could be greater than maximum capacity. You are entirely right. Um, in fact, why does it check it before checking the capacity to? I feel like the right thing to do here is actually let size is size next power of two uh, and then say uh, I feel like that's really That's really what it's trying to compute, right? Yeah, I think I think that's actually what it's trying to compute. Let's try that. Cannot infer type for type parameter k. That is true. We haven't said what the type of our our thing is here. So let's say this is going to be over. It's going to be from string to string. Or maybe it's just going to be from, sure, from string to string. That seems, uh, it's going to complain my lifetimes. Uh, it's going to be from u size to u size. Ah, great. It crashed. <laughs> uh, oh, and it's complaining about this. That's fine. Okay, we have our very first test and it fails. Great, so we actually have something to do this stream. It does not just immediately work. Uh, converting a null shared into owned. Oh, that seems bad. Oh, I want these to go away. In um, uh, the next nightly, Could, maybe I should just switch to nightly. Um, uh, they fixed so that panics would start here as opposed to at the begin panic business when you do unwrap and uh, stuff. Um, all right, so let's look at this. Um, where does this happen? In drop in 792. Oh, I know why this is. Um, uh, if we never put into the table, we never allocate a table. Uh, and because we never allocate a table, there's nothing here for us to adopt, right? It's just gonna be dropped. Um, so I think actually, uh, let's look at what, 
oh, there's no destructor in the Java version. In Java, the destructor is just the default, I assume. Isn't there a destructor? Is it like tilde or something? I forget. I guess not. Um, so for us, what we actually want to do here is... Um, if table is null, uh, then we just want to return. Uh, table was never used. Was never allocated, I guess. Okay, so our te first test passes. Uh, it's perhaps entirely unsurprising because all this test does is it creates a new map and then drops it. It doesn't actually do any operations on it, but it does mean that we have a passing test. That's always a good place to start. Um, now let's see. Again, this is sort of the set of basic tests, right? Uh, we're going to do map.insert. Is it put that it's called here? Oh, no, yeah, we have an insert. Um, map.insert, and we're going to insert 42 and 0. Uh, and we're going to unwrap. We're going to... No, it's not an unwrap. This returns whether or not there was an old value. So let's just, I guess we can do um, uh, old. Uh, and then we want to assert old is none. Um, what would happen if you insert and then remove the element? Uh, then we would do an allocation, right? If you insert something, um, then that's going to allocate the first sort of set of bins. And then when you remove it, the bins are still going to be there. It doesn't eagerly deallocate. Um, okay, let's see if just a straight up insert works. It does not crashes. Converting zero into owned. Okay, that seems like not something we want to do. Uh, where does this crash? This crashes also in drop at 803. Um, it also crashes in drop, which is interesting. See, notice that this code um, is, this code is not in the Java code, right? This is code that we ported ourselves or that we wrote ourselves in order to deallocate. Mm. And one thing we didn't account for here is that uh, remember how uh, in in the Java world or in, in the in concurrent hash map, um, it lazily allocates things, including bins. And so each bin can actually be null. Um, and that's something we didn't take care of here. So if bin uh, is null, um, then continue. Uh, bin was never used. Um, one thing to, that's worth noting here is the fact that we panicked and drop means that we did not panic in the insert. The insert actually, well, the, the insert code ran. I can't guarantee that it did the right thing. Um, okay. How about that? Oh, oh interesting. Uh, I see. So we actually need to, I guess, load it. Um, it's a little wasteful because we know that we own it. Isn't there a method for doing that? Well, it's into owned, I guess. Um, but into owned fails if the thing is null. So I'm a little surprised that um, let's do cross beam. Let's look at cross beam here uh, for uh, epic. Uh, so we have an atomic. What can I do about that? Okay, we, we really just need to do a load. That's fine. Okay, so we're just going to check whether that bin is null. 
All right, so what this means is we successfully created a map, allocated the map, right? Because that's the first thing insert will do is allocate the map um, and then do the insert and then drop the map. Uh, and none of that panicked, right? Let's just, let's just run this a few times just to see that it doesn't like, not an obviously broken one. Okay, so it, I mean, there's only one thread here, so it'd be very surprising if this was racy, but it's worth testing. Okay, this seems fine. Um, and now, uh, get empty. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do uh, a get of let's say 42. Um, and remember that currently our get API is such that you have to provide a guard. Um, this is something that we want to change, but we haven't changed yet. Uh, cross beam uh, epic. Um, I forget, is it just here? Pin, yeah. Uh, so we need to do let guard is epic pin. map dot get the guard uh, and then we want to assert that e is none right so notice that this it's a little awkward to have to do this for every time you want to do a get there are reasons to enable this api which is you if you if you know that you're going to do multiple gets, you might only want to use one guard because um, pinning the guards does involve some atomic operations, um, and in particular, whenever you release the guard, you might have to collect some garbage. And so there's like an argument for still exposing this API for things like batch operations, uh, but that's something we think about later. But in particular here, we just want to check that if we do a get on an empty map, um, it actually it doesn't crash basically. Uh, so let's see what that does. Okay, that works. Great. So get can correctly handle an empty map. That seems promising. All right. Now for the big daddy of basic tests, which is insert and get. What do we think? What do we think here? How's this going to work? We're just going to do map.insert and then we're going to assert and then we're going to do dot unwrap and then we're going to assert equal e and uh, zero now this won't quite be right um, because this is going to return us a shared Right. This is again because we don't have this guard API. This gives us sort of a reference to the value, but because it's a concurrent map, it's not just like a, a reference to v where v is the value type. Instead, it's a it's sort of a wrapper around that reference to keep track of things like garbage. Um, and so we can't quite do this. This will probably have to be a uh, like an unsafe deref. This is another reason why we want um, want that API to be better. The reason this is unsafe is because we need to, uh, the unsafe here implies, and we could write this here, uh, safety, um, the map guarantees that it will not free uh, uh, something there is a shared to, right? Well, yet another reason why this API is just not great and will want some additional wrappers. Um, do you really need to make the map mutable? No, you're right. I do not because it's concurrent. Yep, exactly. So this is an important observation. Um, one of the reasons you can't use a normal hash map in a concurrent context is because in a concurrent context, you're, you're going to um, you have multiple threads that all have sort of pointers to the map through like an arc or whatever, um, which means that they have shared references, right? They don't have a mute reference. They just have a regular reference. Um, and the hash map API for things like insert takes a mutable reference. And this is why you just can't use it in that context. Um, whereas in our map, we want it to be accessible from multiple threads at once, which means that insert just takes a ref self. It does not take a mutable reference to self, and therefore we don't need a mutable. Uh, we don't need mutable access to the map. Um, you cannot write to the shared. 
Well, actually, uh, it's a good question. What does shared let me do? Yeah, shared um, shared does not, well, you can do a deref mute, but it's unsafe because it's a, it's a shared reference, right? But this is another reason why we want this wrapper is because shared is a really low level primitive, like a concurrency primitive that we don't want our users to have to think about. Um, all right, Let's see how that works. Uh, use size equals integer. Right. <gasps> Insert and get works. Okay, what does this mean? This means that we created the map, we allocated the map, we did an insert into the map, and then we did a get of the key that we inserted, and we indeed got the value that we wrote, and then the map gets dropped. So this is amazing, right? This already means that the the map um, like doesn't immediately break when you try to use it for something. Mm. It's still a very basic test, right? All this means that you can insert and get. Um, but that's still pretty exciting. Right, so the obvious thing to do next is to, um, to do this. Um, that is, we want to create an entry. Uh, we want to, we don't really need the read here, but we want to uh, update that entry with a different value. Um, Um, then we want to check that we indeed got that value. Um, and then we want to remove the value. Um, I think we, we added a remove, right? <laughs> we did not add remove. It's called delete. Okay, so we don't have a remove. Great, that's fine. Create, read, up, create, update, read. So this is update, really. Um, and let's see that this actually works. Um, one thing we'll want to do eventually too is to check that our garbage actually gets collected. This is not something we're really testing at the moment. Um, right? Because we don't know that the zero actually gets deallocated. In the case of a zero, it just it, there's no deallocation that happens, uh, but we'll want to test that actually tests draw. But let's see whether this works. That also works. Okay, this seems pretty promising. Um, and now we want something that uh, drop value. Okay, so what are we gonna do here? Well, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna have a derive, I guess, uh, hash eek partial eek struct foo um, and uh, what do I want from the struct um, I want this to like notify on drop and then I want to impl drop for notify on drop Uh, and then there's going to be, have to be some code here and there's going to have to be some code here. Um, and then here's the intention. If I make the value here, notify on drop and make a notify and drop here, make a notify and drop here. Uh, and then I don't even need to care about the get. Um, what do I want to check here? Um, I guess here I want to check that first notify on drop was dropped. Uh, and then I want to drop the map. And then I want to check that the second notify on drop is dropped. Right? Does this make sense? Because this is not guaranteed, right? We've implemented our own drop drop uh, implementation that does this like 
uh, garbage collection using epics and stuff. And so it's not immediately obvious that this is going to work correctly. The question becomes, how do we actually track whether or not something has been dropped? Um, I think the way we're going to have to do this is we're going to use uh, standard sync. Um, let's do arc and mutex. Or arc and atomic bool is probably sufficient. So notify on drop is going to contain um, an arc atomic bool. And then the drop is going to be self drop store uh, true. And I guess we'll also use uh, atomic ordering. And that is also where atomic bool lives. Um, so we're going to have like. Uh, dropped one is going to be arc new uh, atomic bool new false and drop two and this is going to be a uh, dropped is dropped one this is going to be dropped is dropped two uh, and here we want to assert that dropped one dot load is true. And here we want to assert that drop two um, has been dropped. There's the one thing missing though, which is that this won't actually implement hash eek and partial eek. Um, and I think the way we're going to do this is just like a V, which is going to be a U size, I guess. And then we're going to implement, um, oh, this is going to be a bane. The problem is that hash eek and partial eek are going to include the dropped here. And I don't think atomic bool implements hash eek and partial eek um, because it requires atomic loads. Um, so I think we'll, we might actually have to write manual implementations here. It's like, isn't that bad? Um, this might be something we will actually need um, outside of this particular test. So I'm going to hoist this up here. Um, and then we're going to need, I guess, uh, hash. No, this. Um, it's a little awkward. This is sort of a helper type that like, I'm sure there's a crate that actually does this for you. Um, but here, what we need is just like so straightforward, right? Um, so this is going to be, it's only going to hash, um, it's only going to hash the V field. And similarly, I guess we want partial eek um, and partial eek. Uh, notice that if we did end up doing this tree optimization, we would also have to require ORD, as in being able to order these. Um, but luckily, we do not. So all we need is um, all the well, we need is eek and partial eek at least for now. And then we don't need the derive. Uh, I guess we might need clone on that. I forget. Um, and yeah, and then we probably here want something like V is one, V is or I guess zero. Uh, and I guess what we could do here too is we want to assert that it has not been dropped up here. It's a sort of a uninteresting assertion, but we might as well do it. Uh, when it was replaced by the second, uh, when the map was dropped. Uh, 
uh, when you did hash for a value. Uh, you are totally right. I do not need any of this for a value. Um, d you are entirely correct. I don't need this at all. The value does not need this at all. So uh, that was a good observation. So let's just get rid of that. Um, I'm still going to keep the V. That seems like it might be handy. Um, but of course, it's the key type that needs to implement uh, hash and eek and partial eek. Uh, so we can just not do that. Let's see what this does. Oh, right. Um, this needs to be clone. And this needs to be clone. Because we want to hold on to the arc so that we can check it separately. Um, it's true that key types should also be drop checked. Um, but for what we're doing right now, it doesn't actually matter. All right, finally something that doesn't work. Uh, field is never used. Oh, that's fine. Actually, let's make this uh, fine. Fine, let's remove the V for now. That's fine. Um, it doesn't work. Dropped one load, 95. Uh, I guess let's move now. Um, it failed where? At 92. Because okay, so this assertion does not hold. Um, so this might be, remember that our garbage collection is a little bit lazy, right? Our garbage collection only collects garbage when it's safe to do so. Um, and if you rem recall back in, um, let's see where we do this into owned. Um, what is this from? This is from put. Um, yeah, that's fine. It's this defer destroy business. And we don't actually have control over when that happens, right? So let's look up the documentation for defer destroy on guard. Uh, defer destroy. Okay, so defer destroy stores the destructor for an object so that it can be deallocated and dropped at some point after all currently pinned threads get unpinned. This method first stores the destructor into a thread local cache. Um, at the same time, some destructors from both local and global caches may get executed in order to incrementally clean up the caches as they fill. There is no guarantee when exactly the destructor will be executed. The only guarantee is that it won't be executed until all currently pinned threads get unpinned. In theory, the destructor might never run, but the epic-based garbage collection will make an effort to execute it reasonably soon. Right, so this makes this particular assertion um, hard to deal with because we have very little control over exactly when this will this drop will happen right so this um uh this assertion is actually not one that we can easily write because we have no control over when the uh destructor um when the instructor is going to run. However, it does make sense that after the map has been dropped, at the very least, at that point, uh, the values certainly certainly should be deleted. Um, so let's check that that is actually the case. That is still not the case. It fails at line 95. OK, um, so this suggests that the value that got replaced is just never dropped. Um, there are many reasons why that might be the case. One thing we could try here is to do an epic pin uh, and then immediately drop it. So basically create a guard and then drop the guard just to increment the epic and try to make sure that um, garbage gets collected. We might not have any control over that though. Uh, 97 is the same line. Um, flush. Ah, okay, so there's flush and there's collector. 
is useful when you need to ensure that all guards used within a data structure. Interesting. It is true that in some sense we would like everything associated with the map to be related to one collector. But one reason that um, the crossbeam epic stuff works this way is because if you have many data structures that all use this epic business, you can actually sh um, uh, share their collection, their collection queues and such so that you amortize the cost. Um, I wonder what happens if we do... Um, we do like guard and then we do uh, guard dot flush even though there's nothing actually associated with that flush hmm interesting it might be there's just no way for us to really force this uh, which would be a little awkward but uh, yeah New character. Oh, interesting. So it sounds like we could just have our own collector associated with the map. Um, so at least this way, when the map is dropped, all the things are dropped. But I kind of don't want to do that. Because maybe we don't even want to... Uh, interesting. Uh, if you force the epic forward by two, then you can assert something gets dropped. I don't actually know whether that's true. I mean, we could try. Um, right? Like, let's just sort of try to see if av advancing it twice will make a difference. Nope. <laughs> let's see what that does. Or maybe, I guess... Uh, Yeah, it's not entirely clear um, when the garbage collection actually happens. Uh, hmm. Interesting. Flush might also be necessary. Well, so one, one issue here is that remember that flush does not get called on the guards that were created inside of the map. Right, insert itself generates a guard for us that it only keeps for the duration of of the insert, and that doesn't call flush. Oh, but apparently this works. It's like two sufficient. It's three sufficient. Three is sufficient, and that seems to yeah, but not always, right? So so what this suggests to me is that. Um, we don't really have a guarantee for when garbage is going to be collected. Um, but if we make this like 10, for example, yeah, even then, sometimes it does not get dropped. Hmm, interesting. Um, w one thing we could do here is uh, input, right? Um, there's a, we create a guard. And we could do here like guard.flush and see whether that makes a difference. Nope. Interesting. Uh, unreachable statement. Uh, right. Interesting. Yeah, we actually need to deal with this up here which is, this is a return. Um, and there's a return here, which we can ignore. And there's a return here. Let's see what that does. Yeah, so, oh, interesting. Still not always. Interesting. Um, what's what's tricky about this is to uh, this cargo test run multiple threads. 
well, the insert happens in the same thread. It, I mean, it could. one thing that's tricky here is it's hard to tell whether this is a bug in our implementation of dropping uh, or whether this is just the fact that like calling destructors is um, uh, doesn't give you a guarantee about when that drop actually happens. It's a little hard to say. Um, I wonder whether if we do cargo T um, test threads equals one. Yeah. Um, so cargo test does run each test in a separate thread. Um, and so it could be the, like a different thread, um, ha like the garbage happens to be shifted to some different thread. Um, I think, I think what we're going to do for now actually is, um, I don't want to delete this test, but what I want to do is just ignore it for now. Um, I'm going to pull this into here after all, um, ignored because we do not have control over, um, when dropping happens, exactly dropping happens. Um, the one thing we do have control over though, is um, when the map is dropped, we do know that all of the keys and values are dropped. Is that true? Yes, that is true all of the keys and values that are currently in the map because they are immediately dropped as opposed to a delayed drop. So actually what we can do is um, keep this outside and still do our, uh, I guess, I guess I should not have removed those implementations. Um, for notify on drop and or is hash. Hash, er, hash, hash. Here, let me let me demonstrate. So if we if we bring this back to what it was, um, have this be. V is one, have this be V is two, because otherwise uh, one, zero, otherwise they wouldn't compile. Um, but then instead of doing this whole like assert that it works during, um, fi uh, I guess current KV dropped is really what I want to test here. Um, and I want to check that if I do this, uh, neither of them are dropped, and then I drop the map, then now uh, uh, map, dropping the map should immediately drop, not deferred, um, all keys and values. So this test, actually, we don't want to ignore because this should be the case that here, because we own the map, um, the implementation of map should know that there, no one else has any handles to our keys or values. And so any current keys and values really should be dropped. Um, and that's what we're testing here. Uh, T, and I probably need to do like use standard hash, hasher and hash. Uh, 89 and uh, because clone must exist for the key. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, sure. I guess really what we want here is um, we really want something like a ref count. 
because um, the, the key can be cloned because it might have to, if, we, if we're doing a resize, right? And the key might be present in both the old map and the new map, in which case they're a clone of each other. And then we wanna make sure that both of the instances of the key get dropped. Um, uh, it's a good question. Good question indeed. Um, okay, how about we make this a ref count? Uh, and I almost wonder whether this could just be arc. Because arc already does this tracking for us. Here's what I'm thinking. Um, what if we don't do this? What if we say arc new of zero, same here. The key and value types are both going to be arc u size. Uh, this is going to be dropped one and drop two. And then we're going to assert, so if you look at arc, there's a way to get the reference count, I'm pretty sure. It's racy, but there's a way. Um, what is the main con for not having each map manage its own collector? Um, it's because you don't get the the sharing benefits if other things are also using crossbeam. Um, there's sort of an advantage to using this, this shared notion of queues where you get to amortize more of the cost. Uh, it's really hard to write tests that assert destructors have run in code using crossbeam epic. Yeah, um, the, the tricky part is that it tries to be really good about deferring things because um, if you don't defer well, you don't amortize that cost, then it becomes really expensive to do these concurrent operations. Um, as far as I can tell, each thread will queue 256 deferred destructors before pushing them to the global queue. And then once the epic is rolled forward by two, the global destructors will run. That sounds about right. Uh, it means that I guess in theory, um, and the biggest problem is if the insert uh, happened on a different thread, but that shouldn't be the case here. So there's something, there's something not quite right. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, so what I was going to look up is I think ARC has a way for you to check how many outstanding references there are to a thing, um, which is strong count. Yeah, so what we want to do is that we assert uh, not equal arc strong count of dropped one. Uh, we want to assert that that is not equal to one. So keep in mind that we, oh, this needs to be a clone, right? Like we have a copy right here uh, and the map has a copy. And so in fact, we can be even stronger about this and say, uh, we want to assert uh, that there are two copies exactly, right? The one is the one we have, and one is the one that's in the map. And there shouldn't be any resizes going on here, and so the two should be right. When we drop the map, um, the number of references uh, should be one for both of them. Let's see if that's the case. Um, and I guess this notify on drop now is going to be, we, we might as well just at least make sure that this compiles, right? Uh, so this is going to be dropped one clone. Um, this assertion is going to be, there are two of dropped one, and there's one of dropped two. Um, once we insert drop two to replace dropped one, uh, then now our expectation is that they are both one. 
at least now we can also here assert that there should be two of it. Okay, so that passes. That is good to know. Let's just get rid of these things that we didn't need. Um, so this test is still ignored because we can't actually control the exactly when destructors run. So I guess let's comment that here. Ignored because we cannot control when destructors uh, run. Um, but this one runs just fine, which means that um, if we ever like modified the drop code of map and we accidentally didn't drop keys or values or something, this test should should catch that. Um, all right, so we, we now have all our basic test work, which is was surprisingly little work, right? Like constructing the test was a little bit of work, but the implementation seems to work just fine. Of course, we haven't really stress tested it all that much yet, um, as we don't know whether things like resizes work. Um, but at the very least, the basic operations of get and insert work fine. Uh, so let's commit what we have right now. Um, uh, very basic tests and some drop fixes. Um, will you be looking at the loom today? I don't know, maybe. Um, Loom is really cool for this sort of stuff, but I think there are more basic things we need to test first. Um, in particular, how about we write a test that, um, it's a little annoying that we don't have remove actually, arguably we should implement that. Uh, but let's have a thing that tries to insert from two different threads. Actually, yeah, let's do that. Concurrent insert. Uh, here we're going to do arc new. Um, map one is going to be map a clone. Uh, and we're going to start as t1. It's going to be standard thread spawn. And it is going to do. Uh, zero to, I don't know, 64. Um, it is going to do map one insert I, uh, thread zero. And T2 is going to do the same, uh, but it is going to use clone two of map. And it's going to insert once. Uh, and then we're going to join uh, T1 join unwrap. We're going to wait for both threads to finish. And then uh, we're going to create a guard. And then for I in 0 to 64 again, uh, we're going to look up that I. And we're going to say that v is equal to that. Assert that v is either equal to 0 or v is equal to 1. This particular assertion is probably unnecessary, but we might as well keep it. Uh, ah, apparently our thing does not implement send. Why is that? Well, if we look at the implementation for Flurry hash map, um, we need, oh, this is probably a property of atomic. Where is atomic? I think we had atomic here somewhere. Um, atomic. So under the implementations for atomic, you'll see that Oh, interesting. Implement send for atomic, where T is send and sync. Um, bin entry. 
Ah. I see. Yeah, so the, the challenge here is that the compiler does not know that the um, raw pointers to tables that we stick inside. Um, here, let me pull up node. Remember that for bin entries, they can either be a node or they can be a moved, which is sort of a redirection saying, this table is being resized, go look over in that table. Uh, this const, it does not know that it's safe to share that uh, reference across threads. And so we will actually need to do uh, either here an unsafe impl send for bin entry, um, or more realistically, what we want to say is that table, uh, we want to say that table is send, uh, even though bin entry is not necessarily send. Um, it's unclear which one we want to do. In some sense, um, neither of them are true. Um, basically, we don't want to add an implementation that lies, right? It is not true that any table is sent because you could stick in a bin entry there with, um, uh, with a pointer that, actually, could you do that? A pointer that was not valid across threads? Hmm. Basically what I'm trying to figure out is the right place. We're going to have to add like an unsafe impulse send for something. And the question is what type do we add that unsafe impulse for? We could add that unsafe impulse for um, bin entry we could add it for table, or we could add it for the sort of top level flurry hash map type. Um, the, the reason we have to add this simple is by default, pointer type, raw pointer types like star const and star mute are not send or sync. Um, I wonder why that is. Given if, if the underlying type is send and sync, then why would the raw pointers not be? Huh. That's a very good question. Mm. It's just default, but it's not necessarily true. Let's look at the Nomicon. So the Nomicon is great at this. Let's do is there a dark. Ooh, call. Maybe. IU. I like IU. Let's do that. Um, let's look at, uh, where is send and sync. Raw pointers are neither send nor sync because they have no safety guards. Raw pointers are strictly speaking marked as thread unsafe as more of a lint. Doing anything useful with the raw pointer requires dereferencing, which is already unsafe. In that sense, one could argue this should be fine for them to be marked as thread safe. However, it's important that they aren't thread safe to prevent types that contain them from being automatically marked as thread safe. These types have non-trivial untracked ownership, and it's unlikely that their author was necessarily thinking hard about thread safety. Um, so in our case, we are thinking hard about thread safety, um, and we know, let's see, what is it that we have to guarantee um, yeah. yeah, in this case, it certainly should, it should be the case that these raw pointers are just fine um, because we are managing the concurrent case for, uh, for table. And been, like the whole implementation here is concurrency safe. Um, and so what we're going to do is uh, obviously we have a we have to have a KV uh, and safe implement KV send for bin entry KV um, where a node KV implements send and 
table kv equal and send uh, where k is send v is send Um, now this this additional restriction on node being send is probably not necessary, but it does mean that we don't accidentally implement send that, that we don't accidentally like change node and make node not be send, and then that error is not propagated up because of this unsafe impl. Um, so we're going to do that for this, and we're going to do the same for uh, sync, where as long as these types are sync, uh, bin entry is also sync. Oh, that seems to hang. Oh, it might just be slow. Uh, what is my... My CPU seems to be... Is this... Yeah. Huh. Well, that certainly doesn't seem great. So something ain't right. Good, finally, something for us to debug. Um, Let's see, so let's just add some prints here. So this is T1 at uh, I, and this is T2 at I, and this is um, get I. Let's see what this gives us. Ah. Okay, here's my guess. Uh, my guess is that this starts a resize and that the resize is what is blocking, right? Because you'll notice that the first couple of inserts work just fine. And then when it gets to 11, um, it stops working. And 11 is like roughly 75% of 16, right? And 16 is the default table size. So my guess is we're here entering um, uh, we're here entering into the space of a resize is happening. Um, so let's do a gdb-p. Oh, what on earth did I just do? What? I did something very weird. I have no idea what I just did. Um, but I guess we got to fix it. Um, how? Sorry about that. No idea what caused that to happen. All right, well, <laughs> uh, so we're gonna p graph, I guess, uh, basic dash pseudo. Okay, so let's look at what threads there are. It's in syscall. It's waiting on a mutex somewhere. That's interesting. It's waiting on mutex on line 298. Uh, and what about Ted 3? It is also waiting in mutex, but it is waiting in mutex in transfer. Okay. So that's interesting. Okay, so let's look at our lib. Um, one was in 662, so that's where thread two is stopped. Uh, and thread one was stopped in 298. Interesting, interesting. And they've deadlocked here somehow. Huh. Wow, that's fascinating. Uh, wasn't there some deadlock detection feature in parking lot? That, that might be the case, I'm not sure. The question is, um, why are they both waiting to take the lock? Or, or rather, who is currently holding the lock if they're both trying to take the lock? 
this implies that one of them is trying to take the lock while holding the lock. Right? Which, um, if there was a recursive call here, that could happen. But I don't think there's any recursion in this one, at least. Well, there's add count. Oh, I wonder whether what happened was. Um, let's look at this. Aha, look at this. Okay, so an insert happened. It did a put. It called add count, and add count called transfer. But it does this while still holding this lock, right? The lock is still held when it counts, when it calls add count. And that is not what we want. Um, because transfer tries to take that same lock. So I wonder um, the, the sort of the easy fix for this, right, is to here um, drop the guard. Uh, I guess let's... Uh, what did we... What was it called? Uh, headlock. Let's call it headlock instead. Um, keep them if you remember there's a there's a lock that sort of belongs to every bin that you have to take if you're gonna modify the sort of linked list under that bin uh, and here we want to make sure that we don't hold that lock once we call add count because add count might actually end up um, resizing the table I'm interested though in what um, what the Java code does here. Add count input val. What does it do? Ah, the synchronized block ends where exactly? right before the point where it checks the tree five threshold. So this is where we actually forgot to release the lock um, where the synchronized block ends. And so we actually need to make sure that we do that now. And that is right before we check this. So it should be here. Um, let's see if there are any other synchronized blocks there's replace node. Um, interesting. Oh, replace node we haven't implemented. This is um, this does removal, for example. So that's something we probably want to implement, but we we haven't yet. Synchronize and clear. Compute if absent is also not something we implemented, and compute if absent and compute of present and compute and compute and merge which we don't have and transfer okay so transfer has a synchronized section which is down here somewhere probably where it takes its lock which is down here, right? And that synchronized block ends where? It ends, it ends at the end of that else. Ah, so here, it actually just perfectly happens to match the synchronized block matches up perfectly with the parent um, with the the else that we're wrapped in that was not the case in the other place so here it actually is fine for us to do that um, but oh what did I just do um, but let's make it explicit here too just for future sanity right all right, let's see what that does. Okay, it ran, but it crashed. Um, this is probably a crash in, oh, it crashed in get, that's fascinating. 
So all the inserts worked fine. And that probably then includes a resize, right? Because remember we had transfer, um, which probably means that one was transferred and our get code is wrong, right? Our get code does not, um, when, when the map got resized, it's either looking in the old table and not finding it, or in fact, that has probably has to be it, or it's looking in the new table and the, the thing hasn't been placed in the new table yet. Um, interesting, right? Because a, a write did happen to every key. So it should be the case that every key is present when we do the get, but the transfer probably made that not be the case. So we need to figure out uh, why that is. Um, let's go to fn get. What was this test called? Concurrent insert. Concurrent insert. Oh. Okay, so that test fails. Does it always fail in the same key? No. This almost definitely has something to do with the transfer. All right, so let's look at um, our get method. And let's look at where it decides to return none. Um, let's go with good old fashioned print debugging. Uh, we could probably do, um, we could use RR here, should be pretty cool. Um, but this is probably just fine. All right, let's see where it decides to exit for that. <laughs> Of course, then it passes. Um, if we get seven, it exits at C. C. The bin is null. Why would the bin be null? Interesting, interesting. Um. Why, oh, why would the bin be null? Well, that's certainly concerning. Um, although... Interesting. What is the hash computed to here? Table bin IH. Um, so this means it's looking up in what is presumably the new table. Uh, and the key and the, the bin that the key hashes to is null. That is essentially it is empty. Um, which I think means what I want to look at is for transfer. There's sort of a, there's a transfer bin, I think, or maybe that's just the thing down here. Um, yeah, this is the thing that moves the bins. Bin is null. This is table cast bin. All right, so this leaves a moved entry in the place. So what this suggests is it's not looking at the old table because in the old table, every bin is going to have a sort of moved entry in it. Right, this is the thing that it's moving this bin from the old table to the new table. Um, and the old table. And in the old table, if the bin is null, it inserts a uh, one of these moved pointers that points to the, the new table to consult. Um, and this means that if the get sees a null, it can't be in the old table, or at least it, it shouldn't be in the old table because that should have all uh, moved entries. 
Uh, so I guess really what we want to do here is let's first do um, here uh, transfer into and then do like a p of next table. And then in our get, let's also do a uh, get from just so we can make sure that we're really looking at the right tables. Okay, so we can see that there actually been multiple resizes. There's one here, there's one here, and there's one here. And they, they occur at like increasing distances, right? Just, which is what you expect because it's the next power of two. Um, so the read happens from, all the reads happens from, happen from 3580, which is indeed the latest table, right? There's a table here, that's the wrong address. This is a table, this is a table. And 3580 is the last one we transferred into. All right, so we are seeing, we're certainly reading from the right table. The question then becomes, why is the bin empty? Um, well, it suggests to me that maybe some of the bins are like left behind somehow. Um, so let's see, resize is finished. So this, let's say print line. Uh, moving table bin I. I just want to check that all the bins are actually moved. All right, so here we move 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, right? Because there are 16 bins. Here we move 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. So that looks right. And in this final move, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. I'm going to stop counting out loud because you can all count with me. All right, so all the bins are at least hit the case where they know that it's supposed to be moved. Uh, all right, interesting. Uh, redirecting. Let's do this. Moving. Um, and then in the get method, what I want to do here is I actually want to print out the bin i. Uh, let's do the hash as well. Uh, right. Just so we have a little bit more information to work with here. Um, let's see. The get is trying to read from bin 99. Well, that certainly seems wrong. Actually, does it? Also, why are so many of these? Oh, this doesn't seem right either. Because this is moving the redirection notices. Is that even what it's supposed to do? Yes, that is what it's supposed to do. Um, why is it trying to read from bin 99? Oh, right, because the, the next table size is 128. 
So that seems right. Uh, so really what we need to do here is um, in the code that does the movement, um, it's going to, right? This is where we have the runs of things that are going to the same target bucket. Um, so this is going to be, So this is going to be low into um, low is going to go into I and high is going to go into I plus N. Thank you. So what goes into bin 99, if anything? Here, moving table bin 35, low goes to 35 and high goes to 99. Okay, so it is certainly moving something there. The question becomes, what does it move there? Um, uh, low bin and high bin. I don't even know whether this will work. Probably not, but we can try it. It's probably not going to compile. Oh, okay. That's handy. Um, now it's looking at bin. Oh, it exited a D now. That's different. Let's stick with the one where it crashes at C first. 103 is what we're now looking for. What goes into 103? Uh, nothing goes into 103. 39 was empty, which would have gone into 103. Right, this went into 102, this went into 104. Interesting. Interesting indeed. Um, I wonder. We probably need more of a chain here. We need to know which bin it originally moved into, probably. Uh, so for fn put, let's go with Direct cast to bin uh, bin i or indirect insert to bin. Uh, do we have a bin i here too? Bin i, great. So what, you know, that's D again. Um, so we're going to get six. All right. Where did six get inserted? Well, um, thread two inserted six. When does this print get printed? It get printed before the insert. So thread two did uh, an indirect insert into one of these bins, um, probably into bin four, because modulo two, six modulo two is zero and three modulo two is one. So, there's an indirect insert into bin four. Okay, so key six is in bin four. And then moving table bin four. Um, bin four 
stays in bin four and nothing gets moved to 20. Okay, so it's six is still in bin four. Uh, this is an indirect insert to bin four, so bin four gets added to. And then where do we move bin four a second time? Moving bin four, the low moves to four and the high moves to 36. Okay, so uh, we now need to look at four and 36. Those are the places where six should now be, four and 36. Uh, 36 goes to 100. So now 4 and 100. Where did 4 go to? 4 goes to 68. So we need to look at 68 and 100 are the ones that have this key. Why does it go for 84 then? Okay, there's something ain't right here. Somewhere... Um, this decides to use the wrong bin. Maybe um, one thing that would be helpful is to print what the bins are. Uh, but doing so currently might be a little bit of a pain. Um, I think we need it though. We're gonna need, um, Let's go up to the top here and say, we want the key to implement uh, display. Um, standard format display. And we want these to implement display. Just so we are able to print out bins. Um, because what I want to see is for transfer, Uh, yeah, that's fine. Insert. I guess now we can actually print out the key to. We can do this up here somewhere. N dot yep indirect insert that key um, and then in transfer we should now be able to actually print out the bin that gets moved moving table bin that uh, and the bit that loops through all the nodes Moving key to uh, so the key is going to be node dot key. Uh, although we might have to match on this. Um, and high is going to be whether the bit is set, which is going to be this. Whether that is one. Try that. All right, so what are we looking for this time? Uh, key 10 and bin 33. Key 10 and bin 33. All right, so where does 10 originally end up? 10 ends up in bin one. Somehow seems wrong to me. I feel like it should be in bin zero. All right, uh, so bin 10 is in bin one. 
and then bin one moving table bin one uh, moves the key 10 to high no it moves it to low okay so 10 is going to be in low which is going to stay one all right what happens to one the next time it gets moved uh, that is moving table bin one uh, 10 stays in low so it's still in bin one and down here, moving table bin one, 10 stays in low, so it's still in bin one. So all the way to the end, it's in bin one. So why does it choose bin 33 here is the real question. Because 33, is not in the high end of 128. It's not in the, ah, it is the high of 64. So this suggests that this is, um, if you count, remember how, um, let me try to formulate this in a useful way. Um, when we do a transfer, we are moving from n bins to two n bins. Right? And for every old bin we have, some of the things are going to move to the same bin in the new size, and some of them are going to move to a different one. Right, Because the for a given key, the way you choose a bin is the hash of the key modulo the number of bins. And for the ones where the modulo of 2n is in the next... Uh, how do I draw this is really the most, the biggest question. Um, I think I talked about this a little bit last time, but um, let's say that we're doing 10 mod, gee, let's just use 10. Uh, 10 mod 16 uh, is 10, right? Um, because 10 is less than 16. Uh, 10 mod, actually, this is a terrible example. Uh, 10 mod 4 uh, is 2. Right, because 10, um, you take away four, you take away four again and you're left with two. And this is basically how modular works. Uh, 10 mod eight is also two. Uh, but 10 mod 16, oops, 10 mod eight is equal to two. Uh, 10 mod 16 is 10, right? So notice that if we resize from four to eight, then things that had a hash of 10 would not move. They would stay in bin two. However, things that did move, um, uh, in this case, for example, the, the modulo, 10 modulo, the, the number of buckets did change. And in particular, it changed into the lower half of the 16, right? You can think of 16 as eight and then eight. And uh, 10 used to be in this half because it corresponds one to one to the old eight bins. Um, but in the new path, it's actually going to end up in the lower, in the high bin, so to speak, right? The first eight, the last eight, it's now in the last eight rather than the first eight like it was before. Um, and uh, its index there is going to be the old bin, de bin index plus the size of this, which is eight, right? These are eight each. Uh, so it's going to move from bin 2 to bin 2 plus 8, which is 10, right? And so and when we look at this, um, bin, we know that the key 10, notice that its hash is like some obscure, like this large number, right? The hash of 10 is this, um, and that number uh, happened to be bin 1, right? Initially, it was bin 1 as we, as we looked up through the logs. Um, and it was bin 1 modulo 16, which is where we started. Notice that the number 33, right, bin 33, is bin 1 plus 32. So the moment we resize from 32 to 64, um, 10 should have moved to bin 1 in the high, high set of bins. Instead, it just stayed in bin 1. So the question becomes, why is that? Um, and my guess here, mm, that 
that is the real question, isn't it? Why, when we move to have 64 bins, which is right like here, we have 64 bins already. So up here, when we're moving table bin one here, why does 10 not move to high? That's the real question. Why was 10 not moved? Um, the hash on n, uh, let's see, the mask is, the mask is n. Let's print out both of these. Something here is definitely off. Um, yeah, what do we got? Oh, this is a D error again. C, uh, bin 26. 26. So where did, oh, this is 10 again. But notice it's hash is different. That is because of random state. Um, get 10. Okay, so where did 10 end up in initially? I should just turn up randomness. That would, it's not really helpful. Um, key 10 ended up in bin 10. Oh, that's handy. Um, okay, and down here we saw that the final get looked up in bin 26, and 26 is uh, the is 16 plus 10. So it should have moved to the high bin when there were 32 bins and it did not. Uh, 26, yeah. So when there were 32 bins, which is up here, right? Because you see it inserts into things like 26. When we moved to having 32 bin, when we moved bin 10, moving key 10 to high, it decides not to move 10 to high, which would be bin 26. Instead, it chooses to keep it in bin 10. And in fact, it almost looks like all of these decisions are false, right? Looking through it, it looks like it never ever moves anything to the high, the high bin, which suggests that something is wrong. Um, in particular, okay, so let's, um, So this is the hash, and the mask is 16. Interesting. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Something here ain't right. I mean, we can check this pretty easily um, in binary. It's going to be bright. All right. So 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Right? 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. So the 16 bit is set. Right, and the mask is 16. So why is this not equal to one? Hmm. <sighs> oh, well, it's because Because that's the actual check. That's why. Yeah. So it does actually move it to high. Uh, it's just my printing was wrong. Um, the, we're doing an end with the mask. Right? Uh, we're doing an end with the mask. Uh, and, and that just is going to leave the 16-bit set. 
but 16 is not equal to 1. It's equal to 16. And so we need to compare to n. That's where that got screwed up. All right, so that means those were just lies. Um, so in theory, that's, that's frustrating. Uh, I guess this has to be as u64. That was kind of silly. All right, let's try that again. Uh, get of 16 and bin 57. Uh, to 57. What's the last move to 57? It doesn't look like there really is one. Wait, did I read that backwards? No, 16 and bin 57. Um, all right, so let's look at the insert for 16. The insert for 16 is bin 25. All right, where do we move bin 25? 16 moves to high. Ah, yeah, look at this. This is a okay. So my guess is it's the it's our logic for for moving runs, which you might remember from part two. We we had some difficulty there. Um, Sixteen is supposed to be moved to the high bin, right? The it does match the mask, uh, but it is not. The high bin ends up empty. Um. So, question becomes. Why is that the case? Okay, it first hits. Z okay, so zero and sixteen are both in twenty-five. Um, and so we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to. So that means it's at the tail. So last run. Is bin. Uh, run bit is n hash n it. All right. Okay, so here it's looking for. Um, uh, it's looking at the bin and looking for the tail that share um, whether they're going to high or low, right? Um, and in our case, they do not share whether they're going to high or low, right? Because zero is going to low and 16 is going to high. Um, and so that means in theory, the run it finds should be just 16. And then zero should just uh, not be in the in the high bin run. So last run should be pointing to the two sixteen. At least that's the hope. If the run bit is zero, that's correct. Um, then the last run should go in the low bin. Otherwise, the last run should go in the high bin. While P not equal to last run. And then it walks all the things that should go in the... Everything that's before the last run and then sticks it in the right list. At least that's the idea. All right, and for some reason here, um, even though 16 should go to high and zero should go to low, high is just null. So we're gonna need, I think, a little bit more debugging here. In particular, I think what, one thing we'll want to know is where the run starts. Um, run goes to high, runs uh, starts at uh, that and goes to high. 
uh, and it starts at, let's do a, node here is going to be uh, last run, starts at that and goes to high is going to be whether the run bit is zero, is not equal to zero. Right? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that'll tell us where the run starts. And then I think the other thing we'll want is um, is this information down here on um, what it chooses to link where. Uh, so down here, we're going to say uh, linking pre-run node, pre-run this to high, and that's going to be node.key and um, no dot hash and n as u64 uh, not equal to zero. All right, let's see what that gives us. Uh, hash and n is not a helpful value. You need hash mod n or hash and n minus one. Um, hash and n minus one gives you modulo. Uh, that is true. But hash and n lets you check whether a given bit is set, which is actually what we want to do here. At least from memory, that's what the uh, that's what the code here does. Yeah. It checks, it doesn't check the, the mask that you get for the modulo, it checks whether that bit is set. Because you can use that to decide whether when you increase the modulo, whether that particular thing moves to the high bin or the low bin. So we don't actually want to take the full modulo, we just want to see whether it moves. Um, that's a D, that's a D, that's a C. Okay, so seven when should be in 27. All right, seven, 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 seven. Seven goes to bin 11. All right, where do we move bin 11? Move bin 11, moving six to high and seven to high. Run starts at six and goes to high, true. Okay, so that works correctly. Great, so that went to, that went to 27. Okay, so here it's, at least claiming that both key six and key seven are moved into bin 27, which is where we want it to be, right? That's where the, um, that's where the read is trying to, ha uh, trying to read. So the question is, why is the read not finding it in 27? My guess is that some later time bin 27 gets moved again. All right, so bin 27, indirect insert seven to bin 27. Interesting, wonder why. Okay, um, moving bin 27, moving key six to high, true, moving key seven to high, false. Aha, look at this. Here, six is supposed to move to the high bin, but seven is supposed to stay in the low bin, right? It's supposed to stay in 27. And yet our code says the run starts at six and goes to high, which is not right, right? The run should start at seven and go to low. But low ends up empty and seven ends up moving along with six to 59, which is not what we want. Um, right. So why does it do that? Why does it think the whole thing is a run? Hmm. 
Okay, it starts out saying, it starts out saying the run bit is, uh, what are we at here, like 16, 32, 64. Okay, so the run bit is 64, or the run bit, let's just go with the run bit is one, but the run bit is 64, and the last run is the start. Okay, so initially it's gonna assume that the run is the entire bin and it is moving to high, which is what it ends up doing too, right? So this suggests that something's off. Um, then it looks at six and it sees that six matches that. Six has next set. <gasps> I know what happens. I know what happens. Okay, uh, let's just walk through it. Uh, let's see if you also spot what's wrong. Um, so initially it thinks the bin is, the run is the entire bin, uh, and it's going to high. Then it looks at the six, uh, it sees that six has an X. Um, then it looks at the, the bit for six and it sees that the bit for six is 64 and therefore it's going to high. So it's going to skip this. It's just going to move to the seven. Then it looks at the seven, uh, for the seven, it looks at whether next is non-null and next is null for seven because seven is the last element and then it breaks. So it never gets around to checking that seven doesn't match the run. So this probably needs to be after the run bit check. So what does it do here? Yep, uh, this check which we transposed into the middle of this function actually needs to go at the end. That should be it. Let's see what that does. Hey, <laughs> great. All right, now let's get rid of these prints. Uh, nine. Technically, um, one thing that would be kind of cool, oh, we should instrument this whole thing with tracing. That'd be so cool. Man, I really want to do that now, but it's like unclear that it's worth the time. Uh, it would help a lot with debugging, right? If, um, if we had tracing support for this whole like, uh, this, the whole concurrency business here. All right. Uh, and I guess, and in the test as well. All right. So here we have a bunch of concurrent reads and writes and they seem to work just fine. Uh, let's see that the other tests also work. Presumably they do. Um, all right. What else kind of shenanigans can we get up to? Um, well, Here's a possibility. Um, how about we do concurrent reads or read while writing. Uh, so here we're going to have a writer and the writer is just going to write into the map. Um, and then we're going to have a reader. Uh, how do you implement that? Which crate? Oh, for tracing. Um, there's a really cool crate called tracing. Uh, tracing. Um, that gives you a really nice high performance way to add trace points and uh, group them together as well to related events and annotate them with additional information and stuff. It's sort of like log, but I think more, it's like more sophisticated and lower overhead. And it's useful in that um, the, you can choose what to do in response to every event. It does not have to be to log it. Um, and so this is just like annotating this library with uh, tracing events would be really cool because you could do things like analytics over them, right? Log, the log crate, for example, is only built for logging your output. You can, uh, adjusted to do different things, but this is like built for, you write a subscriber that chooses what to do with the events. 
Um, I highly recommend you look into this, but I'm not actually going to spend time um, adding the tracing right now. Uh, okay, so read while writing is going to spin up a thread that's going to do a bunch of writes. And then it's going to spin up a thread that does a bunch of reads. Uh, uh, that's a good question. What is the reader going to do? I think, so there are two options here. One is we just let them race. Uh, we just have them all do like reads and writes and not really check what the results of them are, but just to check that like the code doesn't panic or anything. Um, the other option is to make the reads actually um, read reasonable things. Uh, like only read keys that have been written. Um, mm, 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 mm. How do we want to do this actually? Um, one option here is to have the writer just write keys basically in order or maybe randomly. And then to have the reader read randomly. Actually, you know what? Um, the right solution here is to not do these. Uh, let's remove that. Keep the concurrent insert. And now let's move over to actually porting some of the Java tests because I'm sure that they do a bunch of this stuff already. Um, no, tracing is not related to Tokyo. It's by some of the same developers, but it's not, It's it has nothing to do with Tokyo. Uh, and it's really cool for this kind of like tracing, especially in low latency, high performance situations. Uh, why do you need that arc there? I need the arc because um, it's the flurry hash map is accessed from multiple threads. Uh, and so otherwise um, the thread spawn requires that you have a static, you have a static closure. Doesn't it seem like this language is a little bit heavy on the syntax side and introduce a lot of friction for the developer? Nope, I don't think so. There's not actually that much syntax here. Um, that's like, like beyond what you have in C or C++ rather. Um, I don't think it's that heavy. Um, it is true that like the borrow checker introduces friction, but I think it introduces friction um, in a way that actually is makes for better programs. Like it, it tells you that your code has bugs and it's true that is friction, but it's the good kind of friction. Um, okay, how about we start porting some of these Java tests? So this is gonna be bright again. Um, and let's start with, oh, I don't know. I don't know what these different tests are. Let's look at something like this one. Times and checks basic map operations. Sounds great. Oh, I guess this relies on a bunch of things that we haven't implemented, like contains, contains key iterators. Okay, maybe we really do need to implement removal and iteration. Uh, yeah, I think we do. It looks like a lot of these are, a lot of these are testing iterators or removal. Well, I guess let's do that. Uh, all right, fine, 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 fine. Uh, so let's do uh, P. Actually, let's do, let's actually add these properly because these have some somewhat interesting observations around why they were broken. Um, so here we have, um, uh, drop, uh, drop lock guard when Java synchronize ends. Uh, otherwise, uh, put uh, add count transfer uh, produces a deadlock. 
Uh, what was the other one we had here? Um, uh, um, also consider last bin entry for runs. Uh, this is um, bin entry moved uh, is thread safe. Um, I want to keep the display bound um, because uh, it might be useful for debugging later. First concurrent test, exclamation mark. And we're gonna keep that. Um, all right, how about we do, because the tests rely on this, let's implement iterator. I think that's gonna be worthwhile. Uh, iterator, ooh. Base iterator. Extends traverser. Okay, what is traverser? Um, uh, a stack is created on a first encounter. Oh, this is another thing where we probably want to add some of this documentation our, ourselves. Um, but one thing that's interesting about traversal is that you want to make sure that. Um, if there's a resize, you don't visit uh, keys that you have already visited, right? If you're at like bin seven and you're like halfway through bin seven or something and then a resize happened, you have to make sure that if a thing that you already visited got placed in a high bin, then when you iterate, you yield it again when you get to that high bin, right? Um, Yeah, I wonder what that actually does. It's going to be interesting. I'm excited. Uh, contains value. Actually, how about we do contains key first? Because that seems like such an obvious. Oh, yeah, that's relatively uninteresting. Fine. I'll do it just to add a method, you know, contains key. Uh, does this contain this key? Bool uh, guard is epic pin. Uh, and then I guess we do self get key guard is some. <laughs> Good job us. Uh, <laughs> we added contains key. Um, but traverser, where, that's where we were. Uh, traverser, traverser, traverser. All right. All right, I'm going to pee and then we're going to do traverser. Actually, how about we do uh, like a five, 10 minute break. Um, I'll, I'll be back in like a few minutes, um, just make tea and stuff. And then I can do some Q and A and then we do iterators. Let's do that.
Excellent. I'm back. All right. Um, let's do, if you have any like questions, it doesn't have to be about this. Let's do like a quick Q and A while I eat a crisp bread <laughs> and then we continue with iterators. Like it does not have to be related to rust for that matter. Just if you have questions, now's the time. I guess in the meantime, we can also read the documentation for the um, traverser implementation. Have you heard about the drama around Actix Web and its maintainer? Yes, I have heard of the drama. Um, I mean, I have opinions on it, like many other things in this world. Um, I don't know that they're particularly useful. I think in general, um, unsafety is something to take very seriously, but it is also um, I, uh, I think people shouldn't be as scared of unsafe as they often are, but at the same time, it is important to take it seriously. Um, and in this case, I think it's like a combination of a, a difference in priorities um, and a bad mix of different communication styles that cause some problems. Is it always possible to avoid unsafe blocks in this language? Um, no, if you need to implement, uh, like if you have to call out to a C function, for example, it's inherently unsafe. Other than Rust, which languages do you think have a potential for the future? Um, many. Like, I think Go does. I think C is going to remain for a long time. Um, I think um, there's some cool, like, up-and-coming languages like uh, Zig and Nim. Um, but those are sort of more esoteric ones. Um, Elm is pretty cool. I think JavaScript is going to be with us for a long time. Uh, so yeah, many languages. Java too, for that matter. Uh, why do you choose the Java concurrent hash map to implement in Rust? Um, because it's a very like well-known and stable thing that is used like used by pr pretty serious consumers, and it's it's sort of seen a lot of vetting, and so it seemed like an interesting thing to port. And especially because it's also like open source, and the license is such that I can do this work, and it's commented. I made it interesting. Uh, what do you think of Microsoft new language Verona? Oh, this is the Rust, but with arenas, sort of. I think the notion of arenas is really cool. Um, it's something that you often want to do in performance-sensitive applications anyway, and having a language that has that as sort of a first-rate primitive seems pretty attractive, but I haven't looked enough into the language to really say. How is Flurry different from the C hash map crate? Uh, the C hash map crate from memory has a lock per bucket. We talked about this a little in part one. Um, whereas this library is, uh, it does not, it does have a lock per bucket, but only for anything following the first insert, um, which in theory should mean that it's a lot, a lot faster and a lot less contention. It also means that reads, um, one thing that's neat here is reads do not have to take a lock, whereas they do in C hash map, I believe. Um, I don't think he even sees this chat. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the chat right now. Um, did you, what particular questions did you have? Uh, could you give a quick overview of your development setup? I actually have a separate video on my desktop setup that's linked in my YouTube channel. So you can look at that and all my dot files and stuff are online. Um, what resources would you recommend to learn how to use unsafe in a safe way? Oh, that's tough. Um, I don't think there are that many good resources for unsafe. Um, there's a GitHub repository called unsafe code guidelines, I think, 
Um, basically, they're trying to work out what exactly are the rules around unsafe. Uh, the Nomicon is also fantastic at this. And hopefully, over time, we're going to see um, more resources for dealing with this. So this is both going to be stuff like what we're building here, right, which does have some unsafe and where we actually talk through what that unsafety means. Um, there are tools being developed like Miri that let you at least be more confident in your unsafe code. Um, and hopefully we'll have some more talks about this. I might give one in New York um, in like a month or so about unsafe. Um, and then hopefully there'll be like more books and stuff on more advanced uses of Rust. And that might be a good way to uh, learn. Um, have you followed Jaya at all? I have not. Is there a Lib Arena and Rust repo? Yeah, so Lib Arena and the various Arena crates are for Arena allocation. But the idea with Verona from Microsoft is that the it's language level support for things like borrow checking at the Arena level. Like you can say all of these things are related to this collection and they have the lifetime of the collection in a way that's hard to say in, in Rust currently. Um, what do you mean, Basil? The Rust Nomicon touches on a lot of subjects of unsafe Rust. Uh, the Nomicon is great for if you already sort of know some of the unsafe. It's great at telling you like, here is how a lot of these stuff work, but it's not great for like learning about unsafe, it, it's gotten better. Um, but if you're starting sort of from scratch, it's not really good at that. We almost need like tutorials in some sense. Um, have you seen the dash map crate implementation? Yeah, it's pretty cool. I actually ran um, some multi-core benchmarks that I posted on Reddit in, in one of the sub threads. Um, uh, dash map is really neat. Um, it's not, it doesn't try to, innovate that much like the the author said too that the the basic idea was let's just build something where the structure is really simple and that ends up performing well and so far that seems to be true um i'm really interested to see it compared to something like what we're porting here which is like a a v very well thought through concurrent implementation and see how they scale so for example here like gets take no locks uh and writes often do not take locks if they don't contend on a bin so i this should scale better, but it's hard to say. Um, uh, can you test the crate with Miri? So one restriction Miri has, and I believe it still has this, is that it only works for uh, single-threaded code. Um, that's not to say that it's not useful, but it means that there's a there's only a limit to how um, uh, the kind of interactions you can test with it. Oh, I'm glad you like the streams. Mm. Do you know why something like box pin async fute await has a static lifetime? But if this fute calls await, the static lifetime goes away. Uh, if the fute, I don't know what you mean by if the fute calls await. Um, do you recommend another book for beginners apart from the book, uh, as in the Rust book? Um, I don't, th there's a book called Rust in Action that deals with like, um, sort of systems level programming in Rust. I haven't read it myself, but I talked a little bit to the author and that seems cool. Um, I don't know there are that many Rust books currently, but hopefully this is something that will change. All right, let's dig back into the, maybe one more question while I finish the last bit and then we'll dive into the implementation again. Also a cool book. Garrett, that's not valid syntax, so I don't quite know what that first bit is. But what box pin does is 
I think you're at least missing a move keyword, but box pin will allocate something on the heap rather than the stack, uh, which means that it will, rather than only living for as long as the current function is living, it will live on the heap, which means that it gets a static lifetime. Um, my coworker helped you out with a project. Oh, WTP, WP2Ghost, yeah, that's a while ago. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a pain, it's true. All right, um, let's dive into how to write this concurrent iterator. Um, encapsulates traversal for methods such as contains value, also serves as a base class for other iterators. Method advance visits once each, is this valid English? Method advance visits once each still valid node that was reachable upon iterator construction. It might miss some that were added to a bin after the bin was visited, which is okay with regards to consistency guarantees. Maintaining this property in the face of possible ongoing resizes requires a fair amount of bookkeeping state that is difficult to optimize away amidst volatile accesses. Even so, traversal maintains reasonable throughput. Yeah, so this is the, the worry that I sort of had was that iterating over this in an efficient way is gonna be a little tricky because you need to you need to keep track of things you've iterated past just so you don't hit them again. Um, normally, iteration proceeds bin by bin traversing lists. However, if the table has been resized, then all future steps must traverse both the bin at the current index as well as at index plus base eyes, and so on for f further resizings. To paranoically cope with potential sharing by users of iterators across threads, iteration terminates if a bound check fails for a table read. Oh, that's neat. Okay, so if I'm reading this right, the trick we're gonna pull is, imagine that you are, how would this work? Um, interesting. Uh, I think what this means is that you're going to, if a resize happens to a bin, you look at both the the high and the low version of that bin at the same time, rather than just continue in bin order. Like normally we're just gonna read the bins in order, but if one bin has moved, we look at its low and its high bin uh, before we move on to the next bin in the original iteration, because that way, um, that way we only need to keep track of the keys that we've seen so we don't duplicate them uh, as long as we're still in this bin as opposed to for the entire iteration, would be my guess. Oh yeah, rustlings is great, um, as, a, as a side note. Um, but let's see how this actually works out. Um, I think at this point, we're probably gonna wanna split this into smaller files. Uh, let's do a... How big is table? Table is pretty small. I think I probably want to keep table. Um, but what I do want in its own file is uh, mod iter. Um, we probably actually want a make dir source iter. Uh, I want iter, um, I guess traverser. Traverser.rs. The other question here is whether we want the iterator to have um, to have its own guard. Quite possibly, it does mean that while you have an iterator, um, you're actually going to hold up all garbage collection. So this is something we're going to have to. Th think about. I'm not quite sure yet. Um, but we are going to need here uh, crate uh, at the very least. Actually, probably maybe it's just table. Node KV tab. I think it's, it might actually just be table, but we'll find out soon. Uh, it's going to have to be KV and S. KVS. 
I guess this is, they call it tab. We're gonna call it table because we like full words. Uh, next, whatever next is gonna be. I guess this is gonna be, these are probably gonna be shared, would be my guess. Uh, we're not gonna, we're not gonna quite get away from these being shared. Tickem. Is my guess. Um, hello, unclear. Um, a table stack, which we're gonna have to figure out what does later. Um, an index. Um, a base index. A base limit. And a base size. I guess we might as well keep these comments too. Um, this is current table update if resized. I think I think that might actually be a just a straight up reference, um, but I'm not sure yet. This is the next entry to use. This is index of bin to use next. I think by use, what they mean here is access. Current index of initial table. Uh, index bound for initial table. Oh, I see what this is about initial table size. Um, so th when you create the iterator, you're going to read out what the, um, uh, you're gonna read out what the current table is. But then if you encounter one of these like move nodes, then you're gonna look at the, you're gonna follow the pointers inside of them, right? But then you have to continue iterating on the original table you made. Um, and so that's why it has to keep track of where we were in the original table. Uh, so that's why it has this like index is like where in the where in the bin we're currently in, uh, and then this is where are we in in the original traversal, or something along those lines. Um, okay, and there's a impl iter. I guess we're gonna have to do like MKVS, MKVS. So it's gonna be a new. Just gonna take a, a little bit unclear what it's gonna take actually. We'll find that out later. Um, but it is going to do self. Table is gonna be. Actually, I guess, interesting. Why does it take all these parameters? Oh, that seems fine. Uh, it takes a table, which is gonna be, I guess, of shared um, table KVS. Because I think we can just load this once. Although it's going to be tied to its own guard. Remember that when you read out of a shared, what you get back is a guard, uh, is a is a reference to the underlying value whose lifetime is tied to the lifetime of the guard. Which I think means that the caller has to hold on to the guard. It's going to be awkward. Think of it this way. If we stick the guard into the iterator, um, actually shared, you already get, okay, we're gonna have to think about this a little carefully. 
how these lifetimes work out. Um, but for now, let's just do this. Um, I guess next. Oh, next is a node. Okay, so next is actually not a shared table. It is a shared uh, node or node entry. I forget what we called these. Node. Okay, so we're going to need node and table. Yeah, so this is while we're walking a bin, next is going to be a pointer to the next bin to look at. Um, so I guess next is going to be a shared null. Um, base size is going to be, I wonder why size is passed. Because isn't size just dictated by the size of the table? I don't know why it's a separate, like if you look at, I guess, where do people make traversers? Yeah, it's just t dot length. And so why, why is that passed in separately? It's just always t dot length. Was F here? Yeah, T dot length. So that seems entirely unnecessary. Yeah, I don't buy that for a second. I don't think that argument is necessary. I think the base size is just the. Um, the number of bins which we can find with uh, table, 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 table dot bins dot len. Um, and I think base index is just going to be zero. And index is just going to be zero. Right? In all of these ones, index is zero. This might be like if you want to in iterate over only a subset of the things, but it looks like nothing uses that. So I think we're just going to ignore it. Um, and then base limit is also going to be table bin slen. Now, these might change over the course of iteration. I don't know. But, but for initialization, it seems like that you should always initialize it to traverse the entire table that you're given. And I guess advance is really what we're going to call uh, is just going to be our implementation of iterator, right? Iterator for MKVS. This is just a standard Rust iterator trait, right? Which takes a mute self and gives you an option self item. Where item here, I guess. Um, is going to be mm, that's also a good question yeah I think I think we're gonna have to be given a guard the the I think the caller needs to maintain our guard which is Pretty awkward, actually. Because um, it sort of means that what we need is a, we need to take in a guard here too, which we're gonna need to use to read any additional items that we read out. Um, so this is gonna be a tick G guard. Um, and then sort of implicitly the lifetime of the map is going to be longer than the lifetime of the guard.
How exactly we expose this to users is not clear though, um, unless they provide the guard, which again is an interface that we probably want to avoid. Um, but there might be ways for us to deal with that. Um, so the item here, this is sort of the same thing as what happens for get, right? Which is that uh, at least for the time being, we're just gonna expose these shared directly. Um, and so the item type is actually going to be a shared to um, hmm. That's also a good question. Yeah, you're right. This does have to have a guard. Um, what is the type here? I think the type here is node. Because the node lets you get at both the key and the value. Um, so the, in some sense, right, like this is going to be a very low level iterator. It's just going to iterate over all of the nodes and then something on top of this. And that's probably what advanced does here too. Yeah, it returns a node. And then you can have wrapper iterators around that, that like filter it down to just the key or just the value or something like that. Um, iterating over the values in particular is going to be tricky because that's going to include a mutex guard. Uh, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to think about how to do that. I'm not entirely sure yet. Um, okay, so what does next do? Well, it sets an e. Interesting, what's this? Okay, so E is the entry that we just yielded. Okay, so we're gonna have something E, which is gonna be a shared G node KV. Um, and it's initially going to be null. And then uh, if self.next uh, if self so really it's not next, is it? Right? Because this is taking e.next. So I think next is really previous. Yeah, see, it, it, it if it returns E, it's set next to E. So it's not next, it is the previous element you yielded. So I think this is a lie and that this should be called prev. The last node yielded or uh, iterated over. That makes more sense to me. Um, and if the previous node we iterated over is not null, um, then what we're going to do is we're going to say um, E dot next, right? It has a next field uh, dot load. And I think we know that the, um, I'm pretty sure that we know that if we hit a node, all the subsequent things are nodes. That's what this loop here is, right? 
if the first entry in a bin is a node, all the remaining ones are nodes. Um, and since we know that this particular one is a node, we know that all its subsequent ones are nodes. Um, and so this is going to, uh, so let's look at what do we do for load here? Um, ordering sec const. Um, and the guard. Yeah. And then there's a loop. And what does this loop do? Well, okay, so if the previous node we iterated has a next, then we just return that. That seems straightforward enough. Um, so this is going to be a loop, uh, and if not e dot is null, then we're just going to do self dot prev is e, and then we return e. Uh, and then the question becomes, can you clone a shared, which I assume that you can, uh, they're probably not copy. Oh, sorry. I should have warned you that this is going to be bright. Um, but if we go back here to shared, um, yeah, shared implements clone. And it should be a cheap clone because shared is really just a pointer. Um, what's the difference between ordering sec const and ordering acrel? That is a big debate and there's a lot. It's not a big debate. It's just fairly complicated. Um, we go through this a little bit in some of the earlier streams on on this port. Um, it, it has to do with which memory reads and writes you can see, and also whether the compiler and the CPU are allowed to do your instructions out order. Um, I recommend that you look up some of the resources I uh, talked about in the previous part, uh, and also just look up like um, LLVM memory ordering, for example, it has a pretty good write-up on it. Uh, how old is he? I am 30. Um, okay, so if it's not null, then we're sort of done. Otherwise, I don't know what this must use locals and checks means. This seems like a Java thing. Um, if self.base index is greater than or equal to self.base limit or Why does this need to use locals? Wait, really? Shared is copy? Oh, shared is copy. Nice. That that makes me feel a lot better. Um, or table is null? I guess actually this doesn't handle the case where interesting. <laughs> uh, this is actually going to crash if the table hasn't been allocated. So we might want to special case that it's a little awkward is um, if table dot bin if table is null <laughs> then zero else table bins len uh, and then this should be len oh what did I mess up oh maybe something down here yeah uh, or self.table is null, or uh, I wonder why are all these locals necessary? I don't understand. 
because these aren't concurrently accessed anyway. Right, they're not volatile, so I don't must use locals and checks. Um, it sounds like it's to make sure you only read them once, but that doesn't really seem like it makes sense either. Um, T is equal to length. Oh, it's because uh, they might get overridden as we walk through. That's why. Yeah, that's definitely why. Um, or self dot table dot uh, bin dot len is less than or equal to self dot index or if I is less than zero. How is that even possible? Where is I reassigned? I is equal to index. Can index ever be less than zero? Where does index get overwritten? Index gets plus plus base index. Where does base index come from? Base index never changes. So I'm pretty sure index can never be negative, which means that I can never be negative. So I'm pretty sure that check is unnecessary. Um, so in this case, um, prev is null and we return none. I guess up here we need to return some of that. Um, all right, what else do we have? All right, now we get to the gory parts. So let I think for tab at uh, is the one that we renamed to bin uh, uh, to bin, uh, and so this is really saying let bin is. Uh, self table bin um, and I here is self dot index. Right, so this is where they do some like funky stuff where they say like let I is self dot index, let T is self dot table, um, and then this is a read on t and this is a read of i and the reason they do that is because presumably uh, they're claiming that these values might change and you want to do the read on the local variable i'm not so convinced that's true but i guess we're about to find out um all right so if Um, not bin is null. Um, uh, so remember how th they're playing this trick where if the hash is less than zero, then it's a special type of node. Um, and they want to handle in particular here forwarding nodes. Um, whereas for us, that's a little different. Um, whoops. What we want to do here, if you remember, is I guess we need to pass in the guard here, don't we? Um, the bin gives us back a shared bin entry. Right, so what we actually want to do here is we want to match on that. 
Uh, actually, we probably want to do. I want to match on that bin, and if it's a bin entry moved, right? Uh, table. Then we want to do whatever they're saying right here. Uh, what about with overflow? Um, it could be overflow. You're right. The the check for i less than zero. But Rust should panic in that case. I'm pretty sure. Um. Because if it's moved, then self.table is equal to, oh, that's what it does. I see, I see, I see, I see. Um, then self.table is going to be, I guess this is where, where is the place where we follow moved? Oh, right. Um, that's going to be in node. In node is where we follow moved. Right, so this is like where it got moved to. Um, and in this case, we want to say that we're now iterating over next over that next table instead of the table we were iterating over. Um, and in this case, self prev is now null because we're no longer in uh, we're no longer on a particular entry. Um, and then they're doing this push state business. And, and I think what they're doing here is actually every time they move into a new table, they sort of they keep track of which table they were in and what I they were at. And then they it, then they recurse into that table. And then when eventually that table um, yields something interesting, then they pop. Uh, when you're done iterating over that recursion, then you iterate back up. Um, I see, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, okay, this is, this is kind of special. Um, so what we're gonna do here is so this iterates back up. So here what we're gonna do is self dot push state. And here you'll notice it actually uses T and I and N. What is N here? N is the length of T. Right. I don't think they need to do this. Um, I think they could just push tab and stuff before they modify them, but seems fine enough. All right, so in this case, um, we want to recurse down into the uh, target table. And make sure we can get back up to where we're at. Um, all right. And then otherwise, right, so that hits a continue. And there's technically like a tree bin case, which we're going to ignore for now. Um, if we get to a normal table, right? So this is e hash is less than zero. So this is if there's a special node. It is not a special node. Um, so bin entry node, right? Which is this case. Um, then what? And they're saying if the stack, which is this um, this table stack business that we haven't looked at yet, what is spare for? 
interesting. Um, if self dot stack dot I don't know what this does yet. Um, is sum. Uh, then recover state. We haven't written this sort of state recovery business yet, right? So we're going to have to deal with that at some point. Otherwise, I guess else if index is i plus base size. Okay, so it does mod modify index here. All right, fine. This like I being able to be less than zero is weird to me, but fine. Uh, as I size, I guess. But it's no, it's instantiated at the top of this loop. Okay, so this would only be the case if self dot index itself is an I size. Fine. So this will be an I size. Um, then that will be an I size. Then, or um, self dot index is less than zero. I guess we'll keep that. Um, this else if is else if I plus self base size is greater or equal to N. Then, then self dot index is equal to i plus self base size. Gee, this is executed regardless. So this is really an else self dot index equals that. And if self dot index is greater than or equal to n, then self dot index. Then self dot base index plus equals to one, and self dot index is self dot base index. Uh, yeah. Okay, so let's see if we can actually reason about what this does. If the stack, if we, if we're walking, and Okay, so, so this is the case where we have um, we have hit the end of a bin, right? If we were in a bin, then this would this would happen. So we've hit the end of a bin. This is uh, we're done. There is no next bin. Otherwise, there is the next bin, and we look at the head of the next bin. If the next bin is moved, then we need to recurse into the table that it was moved to. Uh, otherwise. Um, if we've stored some state, then why do we recover the state? This one's unclear to me as of yet. Um, let's ignore that for now. Then, um, interesting. Oh, this is why this is not bin. This is E. Oh, I see what's going on. Then this is really uh, E is equal to N, which is not really true, but it's kind of true. It's also a little awkward. It's not clear that I'm allowed to do that. Um, notice that this this is like little sneaky clause here of e equals tab at. So if we get to here, then uh, we're gonna then the next node we're going to consider is going to be the start of the next bin, right? And then if that happens to be a forwarding node, then we set e to null because we're gonna start iterating over the other table instead. Um, 
But if it was not a forwarding node, then we, why do we recover the state? Still don't know that. Um, but then we, Let's say we take neither of these cases, then we will just start iterating over that bin. Okay, so then it becomes, what are these two cases? Well, this case uh, has to do with this push state. So I guess we need to look at what push state is. Saves traversal state upon encountering a forwarding node. Uh, okay, so it just preserves a bunch of state and recover state just brings us back. Not clear why that matters. Like, isn't it just going to Um, when it hits a forwarding node, it's going to set the table to the next node and e to null. And it's going to store the current, the table we were at. And it's going to loop through. E is going to be null, so it's going to go down here. It's going to look at the first bin. It's not special, so it's going to go down here. And stack is going to be not equal to null, so it's going to immediately recover that state. So this write to tab is just going to be overwritten. Ah, but we're going to read from tab first up here before it gets recovered. Ooh, this is some sneaky code. Um, I see what's going on. Uh... Oh, that is all sorts of sneaky. Okay, let me see if I can explain what's going on here. Um, when we hit a forwarding node, here's what we're going to do. We're going to set the current table. We're going to store the table we're currently in. Like we're going to store basically our current state. And then we're going to recurse into that table. Uh, and then we're going to continue. And when we continue, we're going to execute this code uh, as if we are in that table, right? Because we set tab and T gets set to tab here. And then we read the bin from that table. Um, and then we're immediately going to recover the table we were in. So we're going to like recurse down just for the purposes of looking at that bin and then we're going to pop back up. Um, it's a little unclear to me why this is necessary. Like why you can't just read out E from here. Like why is the solution not to do here E is equal to tab at this uh, and I, I'm not sure. What does push state do? Stack is S. It doesn't actually clear any state. Um, okay, so it's going to immediately recover the state again. And then it's going to continue. And now E is going to be not null. So now then it's going to walk the bin. Just hit th this case repeatedly. And then eventually it'll get to the end of the bin that we sort of popped into. And it's gonna, uh, and then it's gonna try to read from the top level table again. And how does it know not to continue where it was? What does recover state do? 
Oh, that's awful. Why would they write it with this? Um, an index plus equal len is s dot length. The question is, how does it end up also, how does it hit this clause? Oh, oh man, this is, okay, it's gonna, the, the first time it hits a forwarding node, uh, it's gonna go into this clause, it's gonna push the state, change table, iterate over and descend into that table. The second time it hits the forwarding node, it's also going to do the same. It's going to push the state. Um, no, but it still ends up in this. It still ends up in this clause. This set stack. Hmm. Oh, this code is written in such a convoluted way. Like the control flow here is awful. Okay. Okay. Nope. Um, okay, let's say that we're bin zero and bin zero is a forwarding node. Uh, we're gonna execute this code. This uh, is just gonna sort of straight execute because it is equal to null, so it does not go in here. Uh, we're not out of range, so we're gonna keep going. Uh, it reads bin zero and its hash is less than zero because it's a forwarding node. Now it changes table to the forwarded table. Um, and then it remembers that we were at bin zero in the original table. Uh, and then it continues, so it goes back to here. Uh, then e, it, uh, e is the, E is null, so it does not go in here. It now reads the. Uh, it now reads the ith bin, so the same bin we were at in the original table. The ith bin. Of the target table. And that is a normal, that is a normal node. It's not a forwarding node, so it does not enter the cells. It does not enter this if. Instead, it goes down here. Stack is not equal to null, so it's going to recover the state. And when it recovers the state, it's going to do this business, uh, which resets the table. Which resets the table and the index. Even though we haven't changed the index at any point here, none of this changes the index. Only this clause does. Um, so this recovers. What is this? If S is null, if we've recursed all the way up to the top, oh, okay. If we have recovered all the way up to the top level table, then uh, 
Uh, then we add base size to the index. And adding base size to the index brings us to the uh, high to the high half of the target table. Except we're still in the we're still in the tab refers to the low table. Um, so this is the termination clause. It's saying uh, if that is greater than n, then we have completely exhausted this bin. Oh, I think I see how this is starting to hang together. Okay, so what we're actually going to do is we're going to, when we hit a forwarding node, we're going to follow it all the way. There might be multiple forwarding nodes, right? We're going to follow the forwarding nodes uh, to the same bin in the deepest table. And then once we've gone through that bin, then we're going to pop up. We're going to pop up all the way. Ah, we're going to pop up one level. Yeah, it's this recover state is not really a recover state. It doesn't recover this state. It recovers us to... Um, it recovers us to the high bin of the table above the one we were in. Okay, the, I think... Um, I think I see how this hangs together now. I think what we're going to do is actually just port this code relatively directly and then leave a comment as to roughly what it is doing. Uh, but this is definitely going to take a little bit of cleverness on the iteration. Uh, all right, let's give it a shot. Uh, so we're going to need recover state and we're going to need push state. Uh, so up here, we're going to do, um, uh, what was it called? Push state. Itself. And it's going to take T and I and N. Uh, K, V, S. Um, okay, so T. I and N uh, and push state seems pretty straightforward. This like reuse business is probably to avoid allocations would be my guess. Um, so there's going to be this notion of a table stack, which we're also going to need, um, I guess, up here. Actually, no, it's going to go at the bottom. So a table stack. And a table stack is also going to be GKVS because we don't really have a choice. Um, and a table stack has a length, uh, an index, a table, and a next table stack. And I think for these, these are actually going to be boxed. It's like one of the tricky things here. Let's just... Uh... No, we're going to leave that for now. Um, all right, and then this table stack, I guess we're going to have up here somewhere. Stack is going to be a table stack of GKVS. And it's going to be something like an option box. Because initially it's probably none. Uh, 
Uh, and then push, and there's also this notion of a spare. What is the spare for? Oh, the spare is so that we hopefully had, do not have to allocate. It's sort of one that we can uh, reset and reuse if we wish. Theory, this could use like, a, not an arena allocator, but it's sort of like a pool allocator. Uh, and this is sort of a, a poor man's a poor man's um, pool allocator. Um, okay, so pushing the stack is going to be that stack is going to be self dot spare dot take, uh, and if. S not equal to null. Let's sum um, S is stack. Then self dot spare is S dot next. Where next, because next is an option here as well. Yeah, this is really these these next the the next pointers in spare are just there to um, basically this is a linked list, right? This table stack is really just a linked list. And what we're going to do is the tail of the linked list or, or uh, if we need a new table stack, we're going to try to steal whatever is at the head of the linked list of things that we're not using. And when we stop using something, we're just gonna stick it onto that linked list. Um, it seems fine. Uh, I don't really know why it has to be a linked list. Like my intuition here would be to make it like a vec DQ or something. Um, like rather than allocate each one, but shrug. There, there might be a reason, I guess we're about to find out. Um, otherwise, uh, otherwise we have to allocate one. I guess we're going to do stack is stack unwrap or else if there wasn't one then we ought to allocate one um, which is going to be just a table stack of I guess only default values it seems like so it's going to be like length zero index zero my guess is this is actually going to be all of the fields are going to be uh, uh, instantiated just below, it's going to be table and next, it's going to be none. Yeah, exactly. So then we're going to say, um, uh, there's like, there's a different way for us to do this, which is arguably nicer, but Instead, I'm going to say, yeah, actually, let's just do, let's do this instead. Target is going to be a table stack, which I'm going to set up on the stack notice. And it's going to have table, it's going to be T. It's going to have length, which is going to be N. It's going to have index, which is going to be I. Uh, and it's going to have next, which is going to be stack. Uh, is going to be self dot stack dot take, uh, and then what we're going really going to do here is if let's um uh, s is stack. And then we're going to do self dot stack is going to be. Um, Uh, if let's sums, we could technically do a map here instead. But what I'm going to do is 
Uh, fine. Let's use the same. This is not really stack. Because the stack is what we're... The stack we currently have, like self.stack. And so I want to use a name that's not that. Um, so if that already is one, then what we're going to do is sum... Um, Uh, we're going to do standard, or actually, we don't even need to do that. We do um, star s is target. I'm going to do sum s. Otherwise, we do box new of target. That way we don't have to repeat the, the instantiator and the fields, right? So this is all get on the stack, so it's basically free. Um, and then we're gonna set self.stack to be either, if there, if we did get a spare, um, then we're just gonna overwrite that spare with whatever is in target um, and then return it. Otherwise, we're gonna use, um, otherwise we're just gonna allocate a new table stack. So that seems about right. Um, all right, and then recover state. Mute self also takes an N, which we still have to sort of figure out why that is. Um, but recover state is gonna do, um, let mute N, actually I guess let's do a loop. S is going to be self.stack. Dot take. I guess this is then really a while let some S is self.stack take. Um, and then, uh, Self.index plus equals. Ah, but this doesn't actually take it, does it? Yeah, this doesn't actually take it. This is while let sum is self stack. That's really what we're doing. So while there is a current stack frame, uh, then we increment index by uh, s dot length, and then if self dot index is greater than or equal to n, I guess actually if it's less than n. then we break. See, this is where comments would come in really handy if the original author of this code had actually commented it. Um, okay, so n is gonna be mutable, apparently. Uh, then n is gonna be s dot length. And index, this is self.index. I, I don't like that in Java, you don't have to say whether something is referring to a global field or not. It's not great. Um, self.table is s.table, right? So this is the popping part. And then s, oops, table. Ho! Oh. Um, and Uh, s dot table is shared null. This is just to make sure. I assume that we don't have dangling. We don't have pointers to things we're not allowed to have pointers to anymore. Um, and then next, and then let next is 
s.next um what is this though oh i see this is we popped s at this point we're popping s that s is self.stack.take we are popping the stack and so at that point once we have decided we're popping this um, the stack then we want to save that stack frame for re reuse um, so here uh, save stack frame for reuse uh, and that includes we're going to reset the table uh, we are going to uh, we're going to add it to oh interesting oh I see what's going on um, we need to we need to keep track of what the next stack frame is, right? We're popping and s.next is the next stack frame we're looking at. And so I wonder why is this not just, the next variable is just not needed here. If you just move this line to here, then you're fine, right? Self.stack is s.next.take. So unclear why that next is necessary at all. But we do need to reset it for next use, and that's going to be s.table equals null. Don't know why they set s.table equals null. Maybe just to not have an invalid. Oh, it's probably for garbage collection. You want to make sure that the in Java, right, it's going to analyze the entire stack to figure out what things to free. And if you had these things sticking around in spare, um, that held up garbage collection, that would be bad. Um, uh, so, but for us, that doesn't really matter because we don't have garbage collection in the same way. But we can at least like make sure we don't leave um, an old pointer around. Uh, even though it probably won't matter, right? Uh, and next is going to be self.spare.take. And then self.spare is going to be s. I guess some s. Uh, don't. Oh, see. Okay, so this code is already easier to read, at least to me. Um, Look at recover state, right? It doesn't actually pop the stack. The first time you try to pop the stack, it increments index. But if that index is still within range of the current table, it's not going to pop. Instead, it's just going to it's just going to go to the high bucket. Um, don't pop if we are still in bounds. Um, instead. In fact, this changes self.index, right? That sets index. So really what we could do is this, and that is much easier to read. Uh, although it's gonna use that here, so. Um. What we can write this as if uh, self.index plus s.length is less than n. It, it does mean that we repeat this operation, right? This addition is going to happen twice, but it makes it much easier to read code. Um, so what we're going to say is if, um, if we haven't checked the high uh the high uh 
inside of this bucket, then do so. Uh, then do not pop the stack frame and instead move on to that bin. Right? So notice that this does not pop the stack frame. Only once we have gone through the, uh, the sort of other instances of the bin that we started forwarding down, only then do we actually pop the stack frame. Uh, and then at the end here, there is a, that's just a break. That's equivalent to a break, yeah. And then down here, if, S, what is S here? Uh, S is just, self.stack, this is the first thing it's assigned to. So if self.stack dot is none, and index again like these like inline assignments and conditionals are make for terribly hard to read code um, if self stack is none then we're going to do self index plus equal safe base size and then if uh, self dot index is greater than or equal to n, then self dot index, then self dot base index plus equals one, and self index is self dot base index. All right, let's see if we follow this. Um, if we've gone all the way down to the top frame. So this is like the original map that we started iterating over. Um, then we're gonna try to move index plus equals self so base size. Does base size ever change? I feel like base size does not change. It'd be very weird. But it does mean that we have to parse all these inline it does not. But base size, how can index plus base size ever be? Oh, I see. That's sneaky. Um, if we go all the way up to the top, th think um, this might actually be easier to draw. Uh, let's see how this works and if it works, ignore for now. All right, back to one of my famously bad drawings. Um, so when you initially create an iterator, what you get is a pointer to a table and that table, oh wow, I need this to be less stupid. Uh, Wacom that command. Um, uh, th this is the pointer that the iterator holds, right? And it has a bunch of bins. Um, and if a particular bin um, has been forwarded to a new table, right? That new table is twice as long, right? And there are sort of, if we imagine that this is a, a current bin, right? then really you can imagine that there's sort of a, an artificial line here that's like the same n as the number of bins in the original. And the low half, like we talked about before, the low half of the bin is here and the high half of the bin is here, right? So we wanna iterate through all of them. And this is at the old i, and this is at the old i plus n, where this is n. But now imagine that this is also a forwarding node right? This is a forwarding node to a table that is 
sort of mirrored yet again, right? So now there's one here and there's one here. And then both of those have their own mirrors. They both have a low and a high, right? And so there's a low, there's a low of, there's a, uh, what would this be? This would be a uh, high of the low bin, and this would be the high of the high bin. And notice the difference between these is n all the way along, where n is like the original n. And so if we have recursed all the way down to this table, um, so the, the current, the sort of current table in the current n, if you will, is like 4n, really. Um, then one way for us to iterate through all these bins is to take the original i we had for the bin we're at and then iterate through i, i plus n, i plus 2n, i plus 3n, etc. until we have ex exceeded the length of the current table, which is 4n. And so that is what this, this code is doing. It's saying we're going to iterate up to the top. Once we no longer find forwarding nodes, we're going to go back up to the top um, and we're going to add base size, which is like the, the size of the first table, so the, the n here, to index. And if that index is now greater than n, where n is the size of the deepest table, only then have we iterated through all the highs and lows of all the forward of all the highs and lows of all the highs and lows of all the intermediate bins. And then we move on to the next base index. Uh, and now the index is the next base index, right? So that would be equivalent to um, us moving on to, uh, why can't I do this? Because uh, apparently I'm bad at this. Um, so at some point we're gonna move on to this bin, right? And we're gonna move on to that bin only once we have iterated through, okay, so this n is actually, uh, base index, uh, base, no, base, uh, what's it called? Base size, right? Uh, and, and n is really this. n is equal to four base sizes, right? So that's going to be n. Uh, and so once we have iterated, once, um, we're going to keep increment we're going to keep adding base size to the current index we're at until that index is greater than n which is some multiple of the some power of 2 multiple of the base size and at that point we want to increment the base index so base index sorry my writing is terrible points to here even once we start recursing into these um, and only once we we've sort of tried to move into this area and been like, oh, that's out of bounds even in the deepest one. Then we increment base index. So now we're going to move to the next bin, which is over here. Um, and then the whole sort of juggle starts over again. This is also why it's useful to, uh, you, you might see from this drawing why it's useful to keep these tree stacks. Because if you remember when we do a resize, we do it bottom up. And so once you have hit one of these forwarding nodes, you're going to keep hitting the same forwarding nodes going down and the depth will be as le at least as deep as they were further up. And so you will need at least as many tree stack nodes. All right. Hopefully that made a little bit more sense than my rambling earlier. Does that roughly make sense? Um, I'm not sure if the chat is working currently because sometimes it gets sad. Um, okay. But I think now we have a decent sense of like, this is, I guess, move to uh, the next uh, part of the top level bin in the deepest table, largest table. Uh, we've gone past the last part of this top level bin. Uh, so move to the next top level bin. It's 
sweet. Oh, chat seems to work. That's good. Okay, you both work. Great. Just wanted to double check. All right, so now at least we know roughly what this means. Recover state is a bad name for this function, right? It's like next bin is really what it's about. Um, but let's ignore that for now. Um, so that's going to recover state. Yep. Yep. I don't know why this is also necessary, but I'm just going to believe them. Uh, I plus base size. Yep. All right. Great. Okay, I think that's all of the iterator code. Right? Yeah, I think that's all the iterator code. Um, so now, the, the only thing where this is probably going to go wrong is if I remember correctly from node, it's not possible to have a shared node. You can only have shared of bin entries, uh, which means that we're going to have to do some like unnecessary matching, which is a little sad. Specifically, um, do, 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 do. this is going to be a bin entry last bin entry iterated over, even though we know it will always be a node, um, which also means that in our iterator implementation, uh, we won't actually do things like, I guess, didn't we have a as node? Yeah, we did. As node. Because we know that this must be uh, a node. So we're going to do an expect. Um, uh, we only ever iterate over nodes. Oh, I guess that's why it's not mod traverser. That's why this isn't being tra traverser. Traverser. So I'm doing something wrong here. Let's, where's my syntax error? Traverser line 35. Great, finally, formatting. Oh, cool. Hi, Zorin. Thanks for editing Rustation Station episodes. It's really awesome. Um, all right. So I think in theory, that means that this iterator should now work. Um, so here, notice we don't actually get to use the n here. Uh, this is going to be e equals bin. But that's fine. We don't really worry about that. Um, OK, yeah, I think that's good. I think that's good. Um, and in theory here, we could totally have some, we, we could have a bunch of test cases here for this iterator in particular, right? Um, I think where this is going to get complicated is, is the guards. I don't have a good solution for that. I think uh, what we'll want here is actually a node iter. Yeah, this really is a, I guess it's a bin entry iter, but it, it really is a node. <sighs> Why does it do that? Um, we, we can call it a bin entry iter. That seems fine. Because that, that is what it's going to yield, even though it's not necessarily what you, um, even though we know that they are all nodes. Uh, bin entry iter. And so this is going to be a bin entry, sadly. Uh, yep. 
And so here, one thing we could do is like, um, in fact, why don't we do it anyway? Uh, mod tests. We can have like an integration test here, which uses uh, super, super, uh, I guess just create is fine. Uh, and here, we could actually set this up if we wanted to. Um, that might actually be the right thing to do is rather than have this do all the inserts, we can just construct the table the way we want. Uh, but like th that would be the, rather than this using the flurry, the like top level hash map interface, this could just use the, like construct a table itself and then do the iteration just so we have more control over like where they're forwarding nodes and that sort of stuff. Um, gee, maybe we just want to do that. This doesn't care about things like hashes. So we can just, it's totally fine for us to construct what is essentially an illegal table here. Uh, so let's do that. Let's just do that. That seems great. Uh, it or empty. All right, so I'm gonna just create a, um, I forget exactly what ta uh, lib, what's in a table again? Great. So table, I guess fine, it'll be an owned new. Um, use super, because I want the types from this module. Uh, and this is just going to be, I don't know, like uh, 16 seems fine. Because it's the default anyway, right? I guess default capacity. No, I want it to be 16. Um, and then we're going to say uh, iter is going to be a bin entry iter. I guess we need a guard. Uh, I guess let's do self. Nah, let's do here. Use cross beam epoch, um, and we're gonna have, we're gonna construct a new one of these. Um, didn't we add a constructor to this? We didn't. Great. So we're gonna do a bin entry iter, and we're gonna do uh, table. I guess shared from table, uh, and we're gonna do a guard. As a reference to the guard. Um, and then we're going to do assert equals iter.count. Should be an iterator, right? Zero. And we're just going to see what happens. Well, a bunch of things are failing. Bin entry. Okay, that is easy to do. Uh, Unexpected type argument. Table doesn't take S. Oh, that's lovely. That is lovely. We don't need the S here at all because all it cares about are the tables. Oh, that makes me so happy. Uh, this, this. Great, great. This is great news. Love simpler type signatures. All right, what else do we have? Well, that's a bunch of stuff here. Uh, I, I'm guessing a bunch of it is going to be related to shared, not implementing DREF. Um, one, one, two. What? Now. Fine, I guess I'll do cargo check first. Um, yeah, a bunch of these are gonna be the same thing. Okay, so traverser is not gonna need atomic or owned. 
we are going to need owned down here. So we'll do this and owned. Um, but it's going to more going to be things like here, right? Where um, it's unsafe for us to deref bin, for example. Uh, and we need to we need to argue why this is safe. This is like the normal the the normal um, argument we have to make. And the argument here is um, that. Um, See, why does this even need? It's a good question. Why that even matters? Like, how could this possibly be unsafe? Shared was read under the guard. Uh, I guess. Um, Flurry guarantees that a table read under a guard is never dropped um, until after that guard uh, is never dropped or moved until after that guard is dropped. Right, this is the same sort of safety guarantee that we've been using everywhere essentially. Um, and my guess is that most of the other ones here are probably gonna be the same uh, what is this index? I. Index I. Right, table stack index is an I size. Even though there's just no way it's ever negative. I just do not believe it. But I guess it was, we, we said overflow. Oh, I don't want to care about overflow. Really don't. Yeah, I don't believe it. I don't buy it for a second. But maybe I'm just being stupid, but I don't buy it. I don't want to inherit their weird oddities for how this should be. Oh yeah, that it didn't compile because I mixed U-size and I-size. Um, but I'm instead of doing the casts, I'm just gonna use U-size everywhere because I, th I think, I believe that that is the right thing to do. Um, is to not inherit the like overflow behavior from Java. Um, 86, no field length on option table stack. Um, okay, this we can unwrap because of the while let's sum above. While let's sum. Um, that should help with a bunch of these. 117. Uh, this is another unsafe deref. Um, safety is that Flurry guarantees that a bin entry read under a guard, or it's really just any read. Uh, under a guard from inside uh, a table uh, will remain valid until after the guard has been dropped. So that should take care of that. Uh, 131 uh, is probably going to be the same argument here is my guess. Um, Yeah, see, this is, okay, so this is unsafe, right? DRF. Safety. Um, flurry only deallocates after guards, guard drop. And we really could use this for like all of them. Uh, all of those in this file, at least, are really just 
um, relying on that same um, that same safety guarantee. 133, uh, take value of method bin. No? Bins. That's the one. 145. Uh, this is going to be the same thing where we're going to do let uh, match unsafe bin deref. Uh, and this is the same safety guarantee. 148. Um, here, here we, we have to make the same safety guarantee that um, for the other place where we follow moved. So if you recall in lib, um, this one. Yeah, so the argument there, um, hmm. In fact, the argument here is the same as the one for why following moved here is safe. Uh, as for following moved in uh, bin entry find. which is that we still hold a reference to the top level table. Um, and uh, since that hasn't been freed, nothing, uh, nothing later than it has been freed either because we haven't dropped the guard that we used to read the top level table. Um, 149. Oh, actually. This is another thing that's kind of stupid. Uh, we need to keep the table. Uh, and that needs to be passed as a shared down here, I think. Because it can't... I guess it can't, the, the table stack, in theory, could store references instead of shareds. Probably. Um... But it wouldn't be able to restore them. So, so um, in fact, well, one thing we could probably do here, let's let's finish it with shared first. But I think we could probably make this a regular reference rather than a shared. And uh, same with this. Uh, in which case, we could even make it a node. In fact, how about we just do that? Um, so this is going to be a reference to a table under that guard, right? Um, oh, I guess we can, that's fine. We can take a shared here um, and then do like this. Oh, I see. Uh, fine. No, th this can just be an option table is the real way to do this, where we're going to say that um, table len is going to be this. 
or a table is that, and then we're going to return some table and table bins len. And that's going to be table, that's going to be len. Um, and the reason for this is because the, we already established the the fact that we're allowed to deref these shareds when we access them. And because the guard, because we know that the guard is outliving uh, this iterator, uh, which this mean this can be node now, uh, we already know that all of the references that we deref are going to outlive this guard. And since we store this guard in the iterator itself, um, these can be stored as references because they're going to remain valid for the entire time. Uh, the reason we want this to be uh, shared is because it's going to be read out by the caller uh, and that means that it might be null, right? Like for example, if the table hasn't been allocated yet and we want to keep that interface. So we're just trying to be nice to the, to the caller. Um, but everywhere else here, these can just be node, node. Um, in fact, it means that this can even yield these because the guard, again, remember, is tied to the iterator. So as long as the iterator lives, as long as the iterator lives, the guard lives. Um, and this returned thing is tied to the lifetime of the guard. And so it's fine for us to return them, which even means that even if you drop the iterator, this, is gonna, uh, this reference is going to remain valid because it remains valid until, um, until the guard is dropped. It is independent of the lifetime of the iterator, which is what we actually want. Um, uh, which also means that this can be a reference uh, and it also means that this is really a none it also means this unsafe can go away um, and here we're going to need uh, this is going to be next and then if next dot is null uh, then e is none I guess we can just do let e. Uh, we can just do e is if next is null, then e is none. Otherwise, and this is going to be just another deref, right? Where if it's not null, then we're going to have to an uh, an unsafe uh, next dot deref. And the safety here is again that flurry only uh, flurry does not drop or move until after guard drop. The move is important here because um, if it can move, then that would also invalidate the pointer stored under the shared, right? Um, and then this is going to be a sum. Uh, and the next here, we also know is going to be a node uh, because only nodes follow nodes. Um, if And now this becomes if let sum e equals e. then yep um self dot table this no longer has to be unsafe because we already do the deref in the constructor uh 
Um, this can now just be a straight up self.table. Um, this does have to have an unsafe because here we're getting another shared um, bin.dref. Uh, but then we can match on the bin just fine. Um, that's fine. I guess this is really... Actually, these can probably all just be um, ampersand star. No, they probably can't be actually. This probably does have to say dot dref. Um, and then prev is going to be none now. It's no more of this shared business where we can avoid it. Um, this is going to be if let some prev is self prev. Yep. And I guess this doesn't even need to say this because it's already, it starts as none. So we can just say if not next is null, then this, then e is this. Um, let's see what else do we got here that does have to be unsafe that does have to be unsafe e can now be set to node no longer need the, the e to just refer to bin entries because the reason we couldn't before is you can't construct a shared node. Or you can only construct shared bin entries. Uh, but now that the reference is, it's fine. Uh, okay, that makes me so much happier. Let's see what this looks like. Oh, I mean, it's gonna it's gonna complain, right? Uh, now this we still need to import node into here. Should make it a little better. Line 45, prev is now also going to be a none, 89. Um, it's going to be s.table. Uh, it's going to be sum of s.table. Actually, I guess really, uh, for this iterator business to work like this has to be option table because it could be that the table stack is generated over um okay so the the, the thinking here first of all was table can be no, none right if um if it hasn't been alloc allocated yet but i don't think you should construct a table stack on something that isn't allocated yet because you wouldn't see any forwarding nodes so technically this should actually you should never be able to construct a table stack where the table is none um, and so really this should be sum it's guaranteed to be and here where we call push state where is our push state up here um, So this is an is none. This is an as ref unwrap. And down here, we actually know that this is um, is none in if above. Right? We know that this is sum because of this is none up here. And so therefore, we can operate on it. All right, let's see what that gives us. 45, expected node, uh, prev, this is also an option because there might not be, uh, there might not be a previous node that we've iterated over. Uh, where are we at 
No, 94. This is just getting rid of the reference. Even though it probably doesn't matter there either. 121. Um, next dot D oh this is just bad parenthesizing of me 94 Yep, this now is just not a thing because um, remember here, this is where we set, when we're storing one of these stack, um, these like table stack that we use to keep track of how deep we are, um, we used to set the table to none, which is what the Java thing did to get things garbage collected, I assume. Um, where, whereas for us, that's now a reference and you can't set references to none. They need to always be valid. But I don't think there's any reason why this wouldn't be. So I think we're just going to do that. Um, and then 130. It's going to be that. All right. How are we doing? 151. Oh, I see. This is a raw pointer. It is not a... Um, it's a raw pointer. It's not a shared. And 151 expected option right uh, expected table found star oh I see it's because this is going to do a match by reference is why and 56 can I borrow s dot zero is mutable as s is not declared as mutable that's fine. <gasps> nice. All right, now let's see if this test actually does anything. Um, so here we're gonna do a node iter uh, with a shared from that table. Uh, let's test the lib. Um, we need atomic. And we need Shared. Wait, how do you go from a from an own to a shared? Isn't there uh into shared? That's fine. Although I kind of wanted to. Hmm. This consumes self, which is a little sad. But but I guess what we can do here is. Uh, let table is table dot into shared uh, with the guard, and now this table can be passed in here. We assert on it. Uh, the iter is dropped, and so now we can do table dot into owned. Um, Actually, I don't even need that scope. Uh, and the safety here is uh, nothing holds on to. Well, to references into the table anymore. Uh, I did something stupid. Great. And cannot infer key type. Um, fine. Key type is going to be use size. Ooh, segmentation fault and valid memory reference. All right, so something here is broken. Um. 
I guess actually there there's there's an even simpler test here, which is we don't even do this. We don't do this. We just do shared uh, null. Let's just make sure that that actually works, right? Like this is just super straightforward stuff. Um, and I guess we need a type here as well. That's fine. All right, so at least that works. Um, so this is like iter new, and this is iter empty, right? Notice that they're different. This one has been allocated, but all the bins are empty, whereas this one is like a complete blank. Um, and my guess is that the seg fault occurs up here where we need to check if bin is null. Uh, then what? What does it do? It only executes this whole business. It's just going to loop, I think. Oh, this code gets executed even if the current bin is null. So we actually need, we need these lines to come down here. And then this is gonna be if not bin is null. Then we're going to do this. And then we're going to do that. Nice. Okay, so we now have an iterator that iterates over nothing. So that seems helpful. Um, now let's see if we can get it to iterate over something that's relatively straightforward. Um, iter uh, simple or something. Right, so here. What are we going to do? Um, well, I guess here there's going to be a bin entry node. All right? Remember here, we're not actually constructing a valid table necessarily. Um, all we're doing is um, all we're doing is constructing something that can be iterated over. Uh, node here is just going to be hash is going to be zero. Uh, key is going to be zero u size. Now this should no longer be necessary. Um, value is going to be atomic new zero u size. Uh, Next is going to be atomic null. And lock is going to be, I guess, mutex new. So we're going to here have to use, I guess, parking lot mutex. And now let's first of all just check that it gives a count of one. It might very well not. Expected bin entry found owned. Yeah, like so. Uh, <laughs> this is actually not what we want. Uh, we want atomic null bins. So, uh, and then we're going to say bins zero is that. Uh, the other one would have created 16 instances of this, which is not what we want. Uh, expected. All oh, right, this has to be a semicolon. We want 16 of that. 
Um, new text, new of nothing. All right, that crashes. Drop table with non-empty bin. Oh, we're hitting, um, I see, uh, during testing. If you remember in our, in our lib code, uh, dropped, what does it say? Drop table. Uh, when, in our drop of table, we, um, we're gonna drop all the bins, but we assume that all the nodes have been dropped by the, the like flurry map business. And so we will have to work our way around that. And the easiest way is probably just to provide a, a helper for emptying bins. So this is just gonna be like a empty bins of a mute table. I have water, thanks. Good call. Um, okay, so it's a KNV. Uh, and all it's really going to do is, I suppose, um, actually, I'm going to make this even easier for us. I'm going to say that in test mode, In test mode, we're going to be really nice and drop the tables. Ah, that's not right either. Um, <sighs> it's a little annoying, right? Because we don't really have to drop things in tests, but it, that, it would mean that if you run a lot of tests, you're just gonna like consume a bunch of memory. It might not matter too much here, but it just feels dirty to not do it. Um, how about we do uh, something like, fine. We're gonna go back to what I had here. Uh, and then this is going to move through all the bins um, and then it is going to um, and then here I guess we're going to actually walk the nodes and this is the same thing the flurry map does right remember the flurry map will walk um, we'll walk the table and for each one, like drop all the nodes within each bin. Um, it's a little awkward to replicate this functionality here. Like that seems a little excessive. Um, the, the other option actually is for us to just construct a flurry hash map. Um, but it doesn't seem great either. Here's the actual solution to this, which is um, impl uh, here. We're actually just going to have a private drop bins on table. Drop bins. Um, and we're gonna, that's just gonna do the same thing of this. Boom. And then we're going to do 
table drop-ins. Save. Great. Great stuff. And the reason we want to do that is we can do in traverser, um, we can do let mute t, t drop ins. And then we can do the same here. Let's see what that does. Great. Okay, so now. Um, Okay, so it means it can iterate over at least one element. And I guess really what we want is uh, something along the lines of, um, we want to assert, I guess we want something like here, e is iter.next. Uh, unwrap, and then at the end we want assert ik uh, iter dot uh, next is none. It's really what we want to do to make sure that the iterator doesn't yield items that aren't there, um, and then we want to assert ik something like the key should be zero. Uh, and the value, actually, key is zero, should be fine. We can make it 42 if we want to, but, yep. Um, and then we could make this, we could make this have a bunch of elements, but I think that is relatively uninteresting. The one thing we can do is at least move this to like the middle of the map. It shouldn't make a difference. Um, what we will want, though, is something like a uh, iter forward, right? This is where it gets uh, a little bit more hairy, right? Where we're going to have one table, and then we're going to have a next table. This is going to be deep bins, deep table. So here, what we're doing is we're constructing um, bins. Yeah. We're constructing the deep table that's going to be pointed to, and we're going to construct the shallow table, which is the one that has just forwarding entries. Uh, and here, I guess really what we want is uh, for bin in bins. Remember how when a table is moved, when there's a resize, all of the bins are replaced with these forwarders. Um, but we kind of want to emulate the case where only some of them have. Uh, so what we're going to do is all of the ones from, let's say, 8 and onwards. Um, we want bin to be equal to, let's say, bin entry moved. And that's going to be at uh, deep table as const that. So this is going to be construct the forwarded to table, uh, and then construct the forwarded from table. Uh, and now we want to make sure that it still yields just that one element, right? So you'll notice that bin uh, bin eight is going to get forwarded, right? And so in theory, it should arrive at this entry in the deeper table. I guess we're about to find out. 
Uh, this needs to be a star. Then. And 261. This should say deep table. Um, and I guess actually here, this is going to be deep table drop ins. Can't compare U size with I thirty two. Uh, what? Why does it think the key here is I-32? Interesting. Well, Uh, and this does need to be mute table. That's fine. Great. Okay, so it does follow forwarding, right? We're constructing the iterator over the the top level map, and then it follows the forwarding record and um, returns the one at the bottom. Okay, so now we have like a low level iterator test, and now finally we can go back to the original test we were trying to implement. Uh, this is going to be bright again. Um, which is this these map check tests. Uh, so I guess skit at dot uh, commit. Oh man, I have messed up, haven't I? Diff cache. It's gonna include the formatting business, yeah. Add source iter. And add that. And this. So here, what we want, I guess, is uh, we added node iter. This add contains key. And the formatting, I think we can get rid of at this point. All right. So now it's time for us to try to port the first of these concurrent tests. And that's going to be map check. Um, and I think what I want to do here is I want to make their tests uh, uh, like Java or I guess upstream. JDK. JDK. JDK is good. JDK. Uh, map check dot rs and so here because I want these to map onto easily map onto the the Java tests if possible right uh, so I'm gonna use the same imports as I used over there um, and now we're gonna have to figure out what to do to this file and to save all of your eyes I'm going to actually no that's not how I'm gonna do it I'm gonna raw. Um, we're going to do map check dot Java. There we go. That way we don't have to switch to this all the time and I'll go over to somewhere darker. Um, okay. Main. Uh, new map. Okay, that's fine. Run test force mem. T1, I'm guessing, is test one. It tests one. It tests one. Uh, how are these even run? N test one. How weird. Oh, the setup of this file is awful. Um, okay, I guess the idea is that T1 is a particular test that they're going to run with things that are absent and things that are not. Okay, that's fine. I can do that. 
why does it run multiple iterators? Ugh. But all right, T1, just, just, just go with it, man. This is gonna be a static string name. Ugh. And U size. It's gonna be a flurry hash map. Uh, who knows what the types here are? Object. G. Thanks. Okay, what calls test? Run test s test test s key. Okay, run test map map class. Map class, new map. Okay, what does new map do? Map class, new instance. Okay, wh wh what is the key type? New object. I see, they're actually not even using a specific type. They're just using the object type. That's chickening out. It is true actually that like we could make all of these generic over the key and value. And because we can, we will. Because why not? <sighs> Awful stuff. Awful stuff is what it is. Uh, T, T1. Great. Um, okay, so key. This should say keys, it's not key. They're lying. Is a vec of k and expect is a u size. Sure, if you say so. Uh, let sum is zero, let iters is four. They do timers, which we're not going to do. Although my guess is they probably use this for benchmarking as well. I'm just going to ignore the benchmarking aspect for now. Uh, for J in zero to iters. Uh, for I in zero to N. Why are they doing plus plus J on one and God, the, and then I want if map dot get uh, map dot get keys I is some. This is where we probably want to overwrite um, the square bracket operator on the map, just so we don't have to call the get method. So we could totally clean up the API for this a lot, right? Um, is sum, then sum plus equal one. I can think of such better names for these variables. Uh, timer dot finish and then at the end cert equal uh, sum and expect time iters. All right, we have ported T1. I'm gonna um, set up the structure around it too before we start porting the other T's. Okay, so they then have a fn uh, test. Great. I don't think I want that. <laughs> I think I want a test t1 present, which is really get present. Let's use sane names for these. Uh, and th this does size s key size. Okay, so there's some notion of like 
a set of keys. Do they run test multiple times? Yes, they repeat the test multiple times, but with the same set of keys? What an odd way to run these tests. But okay. Um, this is going to be a let uh, size s key absent. Okay, so the call to the call to test is they do let's size. Okay, they ah they shuffle the keys. That's how they differ with each repetition. Um, maybe this would be good for a macro actually. Um, is keys dot len. Uh, don't care about the start time. Okay, so there's a, it's like a let keys is equal to a vector of some form. And that vector is of size, where does size come from? Sure, why not? Num tests. N no, I refuse. Uh, size is 50,000. Uh, where does absent size come from? Okay, so they have const size. It's going to be 50,000. They have const absent size, which is going to be 117. Um, all right. And then they really have a, this is really a macro rules, uh, something like stress maybe. which really just takes the name of a testing function. Well, let's write it for one first and see what comes out the other side. Uh, let keys is going to be some vec. Uh, then there's going to be a keys dot shuffle, which means we're going to need RNG stuff. Let's do that in a bit. Absent i is new object. Why do they even have an array of absent? This variable is not used. Oh, it's a. Ugh. Ugh. Awful. Awful stuff. Okay, so they have a vector of absents, which are just objects. All right, all right, all right. Run test. Size is keys dot len, and then what else does test do? The keys are just basically random numbers, because um. So in if I remember correctly, in Java, objects are hashed by their pointer which is sort of kind of random. And so what this is going to do is it's going to give you different objects each time. Um, so really, this is going to be something like um, a zero to size map nothing uh, like rand sort of collect. Um, 
And there's an argument for like, you could shuffle it if you want to, but now that it's random anyway, it's like not clear it matters. Um, all right. And then this computes size again, because of course, why not? Uh, get present is then passed in. Why is this a separate parameter? Isn't it always just the length of the third field? It's definitely always just the length of the, the number of keys. Like they say size equals key dot length and absent size, if we recall, absent size is just the size of absent. So in all these cases, the first argument is just the length of the third argument, right? Or am I missing something? Certainly for T1. All right. So this is not going to take an N. It's also not going to have a name. It is going to take a keys and it is going to take an expect. And then this is just going to be for key in keys. And then this is just going to be key. Great. That is much better. That makes me much happier. Uh, now, get present is going to do that. Uh, and the as the is the s actually just empty? Nothing populates the s, right? It's just new map, which just creates a new instance. Okay, so it is indeed initially empty. And that is presumably why why does it expect present? No, 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 no. Here it actually expects all of them to be present. Uh, where does it fill that? It doesn't, uh, instead, this put test fills the map. So that's why. <sighs> oh, it's so stupid. It's so stupid. Um, so really there's just one test and it's like everything. Uh, and the everything test uh, is going to construct a bunch of keys. Uh, then it's going to run a put test, which is T3, because of course it's T3. Uh, and it's going to give OK. So OK, 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 OK. So there's a map, which is going to be just a flurry hash map new and t3 is going to be given a reference to the map a reference to the keys and uh, i think that's probably it actually so t3 Bear with me here. Uh, T3. Why these names? Why? Why? It's awful. Okay, it's going to be generic over that. This map is actually going to be uh, this. And this is going to be uh, this. Um, it's going to take also a map, of course, of K and V. Uh, 
uh, and it's going to take a keys and it's going to take an expect very exciting and what is it going to do with it well sum is null zero null. Uh, n if I recall is size, which is the length of key it's so awful. for i in zero, fine, uh, zero to keys len. And then if uh, map dot put keys i absent, which not entirely clear what this is going to be yet. Absent mask. Uh, is none. Okay, so expect here is the number of non overwrites. And then assert equals some um, and expect. It's a little unclear what this absent business is. I think. I think this is really just going to be like a non absent size. What an insane way to. Okay, absent mask is absent size minus one. Absent size minus one. And this is gonna be like a... I, uh, sure, an option of u size of absent size. I'm just going to put absent that seems fine. Although there's a, the absent things are all supposed to be distinct. So that's not going to work, but let's leave it for now. Cause it's stupid anyway. Um, okay. And so everything is going to run T three with that and keys and expect uh, expect all of them to succeed. It's going to run it again, and it's going to expect none of them to succeed. Um, so this is put absent. This is put present. Uh, then I'm just going to ignore contains key. yeah let's just ignore that for now let's let's do the ones we have uh why is t6 different than t1 <laughs> why why are any of these things the way they are what an insane way to i can't find okay so t1 is going to be given a map and keys and we're going to expect to get zero and then get absent is going to be still s, but the keys are going to be all the absent keys.
I see. So the absent keys. There's going to be some set of absent keys and there's going to be some set of present keys and we need them to be separate from one another. And so here, this is where Java has a bit of an advantage in that they are all distinct anyway. Uh, and what we are going to do is this. Uh, keys dot shuffle. Uh, and here we're going to need an RNG at some point. And then we're going to say key. Uh, absent keys is um, keys zero to uh, absent size and keys is going to be keys absent size and onwards And I don't know why this is using absent as the values. Any ideas? We'll rerun the test with the same keys, but in shuffled order. Yeah, so we can do that too pretty easily now. Um, but like, why is it using Why is it using the absent things as values? Is that just a way to choose random? I, I, th I think maybe so. Ah, it can't quite be random because we have to be able to check for it later. That's what's going on. Uh, okay, so we're going to go with values. Uh, and this is going to be values i mod values lin. Um. Yeah, the trick here is we need to we need to fill the map with a bunch of values, but in order for us to later check that the right values are there for the right keys, um we need to be able to refer back to what the value should be for any given key, um, which is what, which is why it's using like a um, it's using a, a list here rather than just like randomly choosing the values. Um, okay, let's make it just let's make all the values zero right now. Um, because currently we don't have any tests that actually check that the value is is something reasonable. So I think, because otherwise we're going to have to like, uh, come on. Uh, <laughs> it can't actually be zero. Uh, Where, okay, how about, currently this will only work with u size for t3, and that's fine. Um, yep, that would do it. And... I think the only thing we're really missing now is like, we need our rand is, what's the current version of rand? 
Current version of Rand is 0 07. Uh, and here we want to do RNG is, I guess I probably need this, don't I? So we've got an RNG, and now we want to shuffle using that RNG. New RNG. And now, we try that. It's going to fetch rend, that's fine. And uh, using new object, we guarantee that the value is unique as well. Yeah, so this is why, for, for this test now, actually, the values are all unique. But they're just increasing integers, but they're still unique. Um, method is never used, traverser. Oh, that's fine. Uh, I guess this can be pub crate because this will be use traverser uh, node iter. Just to get rid of that warning lib iter that's pub and pub crate great unused import that's fine I don't really care about it anymore um, but it doesn't actually run. Oh, right. For this to work, I need uh, mod Doris and I need mod, what's it called? Map check. For that to work, I think. Mer? What am I missing? Test JDK. No test target name JDK. Uh, oh, I probably need um, test JDK mod. Probably has to be test JDK RS for it to pick it up. This seems like a bug, actually. This seems like something that should be fixed. Um, Yeah, this is definitely broken. File not found from module map check. Yeah, this is very broken. This is... Uh, um, I uh, forget what the, it's like test JDK map check. This should not be necessary. Um, but it suggests to me that the paths are just completely off. That's too bad. Um, all right, so map check. At keys is not an iterator. That is totally right, because it's already now a slice. Um, put is private. That seems unfortunate. Right, that's because it's called insert. Also, this needs a guard. This should say insert. What else do we have? Absent size. This was absent mask. And in fact, these two I'm not using yet, so we can get rid of them. Uh, 38. Mm, okay, we need some brackets there that seems fine 
pretty sure this is valid. Um, method not found in flurry hash map. 15. Interesting. Ah, size. Um, method not found. Oh, yeah, this, <laughs> this is only available assuming that you follow all the bounds that Flurry HashMap requires of you. Which is admittedly a little annoying, but it's fine. We're gonna have the same for T3, except we don't need the value. Uh, and we need uh, use standard hash, hash. 18. Don't care about the iteration, that's fine. Don't care about arc. Do you care about 34? Nope. 33. Cannot move out of keys. I see. I think we're actually going to require that it's copy. Uh, yes, we're going to require that it's copy. Either that or we could have all the, all the values be references, but I think we're just going to say copy instead for now. Hey, all right. Whew. It's, I've, I've been amazed actually this stream how uh, everything has worked. Like not quite. There have been some things we've had to debug, but like th this is like one of their test cases, and it just it just works. I'm sure there are things that are broken, um, but like I, I think this also implies, given the tests we've written so far, that the implementation is like actually a pretty faithful port. Because otherwise, a bunch of things would be broken, right? But here, it, it actually looks like it does, like it does resizing, um, inserts and get map with each other. Um, it does these like forwarding, iteration works fine. Um, that's pretty neat. That's pretty neat, not gonna lie. Um, I It's already, we're already like almost six hours in. So I think I'm gonna end it there. Let me just commit the stuff that we have. Um, add tests. Uh, and I want, let's see, start porting Java tests. Um, Visibility issues. Uh, the, there's obviously there, there's a bunch more of test suites that need to be ported, but I think this is something where it would be great if P, if like you as the viewers like take a stab at porting some of these tests now that we have the rough framework in place, um, and just like see if they work. If something is broken, then we should fix it. Uh, but at least now we have get insert and iterators. And so that should be enough for you to develop at least most of those tests. And in theory, for people to start doing benchmarks. Um, once we get some more tests, we can set up like CI and stuff on it as well. Um, the biggest sort of feature I think that is missing, uh, apart from the ones we talked about very early in the stream of sort of optimizations, is support for remove. Um, the remove method, I think, is not that complicated compared to what we've ported so far. So if you want to take a look at it, I think you should. Um, 
As mentioned though, it'll be a while until I do the next stream. I'll still monitor this repository and like try to handle things like pull requests and stuff, uh, but I won't be doing a stream on it for a while. Um, my guess is that the next stream will be like in a couple of months. I don't know exactly, um, but know that I still want to do more streams. I just need to settle my, settle my PSG first. Um, so thanks everyone for watching, uh, keep like watch this repository and, and see what happens and please like consider this project, our project, not my project. Um, if you want to like submit PRs to add CI, improve the readme, improve the docs, like, or add tests, like please, please do. Uh, and I will do whatever I can to actually keep up with whatever you contribute. Um, I hope it's been useful. This will, I don't know whether we'll do more streams on concurrent hash map itself, because I think the port is now, it's like unclear that a fourth part would teach you that much more about about new topics as opposed to just more about concurrent hash map. Um, so take a look at the live coding voting page that, ooh, that's a good question. Does that even still work? It does. Um, so here you can vote on what streams you want to see next. Um, so feel free to go in there and vote. I'll post the, the link in chat. Uh, the repo I think was linked above. It's just on GitHub, um, John who slash flurry. I don't know if that's a name that will stick, but I'll post it into chat as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, so vote there for the upcoming stream idea that you want to see. And whenever I end up streaming next, that will probably be what I'm doing. Um, I'm also giving uh, a couple of talks in February that I hope will be published online. Uh, and so I'll tweet out um, links to those when they are. Same as with this episode, as always, the recording will be up. Um, just, yeah, just feel free to follow me on Twitter and then you'll see any of these announcements. Great. Thank you everyone for watching. It's been fun. And I will see you... Uh, the next time I stream. So long, farewell.